Inflation goes to the point where the Fed has to raise rates. They're out. If the stock market corrects, they're not coming back. Yes, inflation is a focus, but the market has priced a good amount of that. What markets are pricing in at the moment is an acceleration of the Fed hiking cycle. The inflation expectations are rising, and what they need to do is manage those expectations. Rising interest rates is a sign of confidence in the economy, not a problem for stocks. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Let's get the training week started from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Live on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa of Rabbits. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market up about a tenth of 1% on the S&P. Tom Keane, this week, it's all about big tech. It's about big tech. It's about big earnings. We've got a great essay by Ian Bremmer we'll talk on later, John, about big tech. You know what it's about, John? I saw more misinformation over the weekend on Econ 101 yes. on price change than I've ever seen seen in my life. I'm all fired up here. You know what? Tim Cook is not worried about hyperinflation. Bring up the tweet from Jack Dorsey. Here's the line, Tom. Hyperinflation is going to change everything. Okay. It's happening. Now, let me say my piece please, and you say yours. Please. You can't just say this is a guy with a beard. He says things like this over on Twitter. He's crazy, but he's rich. He's a little bit eccentric. Tom, this is the CEO of a $100 billion firm in the financial service sector. To hear someone say something like that, can you imagine if James Gorman or Jane Fraser said something like that, Tom, on the weekend? That would be the front page of the Financial Times, well, without a doubt. Is, is, and I give great credit to Brian Moynihan, who's maybe the best spinner of this. These people don't want to do economics. Everybody else is out there doing it. What we're going to do through the week, folks, is talk to different opinions from economists about this inflation worry. And John, that's an overlay on earnings. John, my number for the day is 16% revenue growth so far. John Stolfus in an optimistic research uh, note says it's not just about earnings, it's about revenues growing as well. Revenues up 16.1%. So far, we're going to build on the earnings story through the week, Please. Lisa. Hyperinflation, whether it's the Weimar Republic or Zimbabwe, what underpins that is a loss of faith in the currency. A loss of faith in the currency. Have we got a CEO of an American financial firm turning around and questioning the faith? in America's currency. I think this is totally ridiculous. This is the CEO of a company who also really likes Bitcoin, right? I mean, this is one of the big uh, bets that's underpinning the crypto asset. And I do wonder how much this really underscores a belief that's growing in the mainstream that has been one of the big drivers of the crypto complex entirely, John. I mean, you have to wonder, what is his interest in doing this if he really uh, is running a massive organization, a massive company? Why would he want people to believe this? So I think we know why. You named it. It's Bitcoin. Bitcoin. OK, but I just don't think we should allow statements like that just to pass because it's Jack Dorsey, it's Elon Musk, and they say things like this and it's OK. Lisa, it's not OK. It's ridiculous. The interesting thing to me is the markets aren't buying it, right? I mean, we are not well, seeing any not. belief I mean, in uh, hyperinflation ever, even though you do have the likes of not just uh, Jack Dorsey, but also Larry Summers coming out and saying the risk of inflation is more than ever before and really uh, dr uh, beating that drum. You do wonder why markets are as sanguine <laughs> as they are, despite all the bond losses and despite some of these prognostications. Clearly, the market's not buying this, Tom, because this is a conversation that remains, should belong well, in a circus. John. Not on a program like this with any real seriousness. And that's the <clears> problem, <throat> except it is serious because it's the CEO of Square Tom. It's yeah, ridiculous. Okay, John Golub in the opening credits, John, with your credit suites way out front like Ben Laidler and John Golub making very clear there's no ambiguity here. As you go up amid good times, yes, you get some inflation issues. Yes, you get some interest rate worry, Fed worry and that. But yep. if those are the worries we have, Lori Calvacina, John, publishing moments ago, getting over the tots loss to West Ham, Calvacina says earnings are, quote, good enough. When Square reports, Tom, at the start of November, <laughs> if you're an analyst of Square, you should be on that call asking the C-suite, what are they seeing in the business that allows the CEO to go around talking about hyperinflation? What do they see in the business? And if they turn around and say, oh, it's just Jack's opinion, I'm sorry, but that's not good enough. Yeah. 
I think if you're running a, a corporation mm. in America, you have a responsibility not just to throw around words like hyperinflation, yeah. Tom. Let's get to the price action up it. four on the S&P advance and about a tenth of 1%. Into the bond market yields up by a couple of basis points to 165.37. And crude TK, 84.39. Yeah. It's a lift again mm. up three quarters of 1%. Just did a gallon of gas here in America. It is higher, higher. John, that's a legitimate worry. A legitimate worry for the politicians down in D.C. Without a doubt, Walls Lisa. Of yeah, indeed. We're going to be hearing from some politicians today. Certainly later this afternoon, President Biden. As far as the economic data, it's pretty light until the back half of the week. Today we get Dallas Fed manufacturing outlook for the month of October coming out at 10.30 a.m. I'm interested to see how much this actually gains, how much momentum the factory sector can gain given all of the supply chain disruptions. Some really great footage of all of those container ships just moored off the coast of Los Angeles uh, over the weekend that I thought was fascinating. Three 40 p.m. Calster's chief investment officer Christopher Aylman is joining Bloomberg Television. The reason why I think this is so fascinating is he oversees the investments for the second biggest U.S. public pension with $300 billion plus in assets. What do they do with bonds that are poised for the biggest loss going back to 2005, down more than 4% Cratered. so far this year? But really, what do you do? How do you look at this? Is this the beginning of a longer term trend, the end of a bond bull market? Or is this just another pit stop on the way lower in yields? Is this a buying opportunity for a, a firm that needs to invest on behalf of retirees. This is really the main conundrum that I see for a lot of the investment world. And aftermarket, Facebook reporting third quarter earnings. Their stock is down more than 15 percent since the September 7th high. That is triple the likes of Apple and Alphabet, etc. The other big tech names have not gotten penalized as much as Facebook. How much is this the advertising issue that we saw with Snap? How much is this some of the regulatory issues that continue to come up, John, uh, as we hear about the drumbeat uh, to their earnings today? Let's talk about this equity market and those earnings. Lisa, thank you. We can do that this morning with Ben Laidler, global market strategist at eToro. Ben, we won't ask you about the Jack Torsey tweet. We'll start with the growth of these big tech firms in America. Ben, how big is it going to be this week? Hopefully pretty big. I mean, I, I think this is all about sort of top line growth, as you sort of touched on earlier, I think that is sort of overwhelming everything else. It's a reminder that I think these sort of growth fears that, you know, the markets had over the last couple of months are basically unfounded. Um, you know, revenues have been beating and, you know, just look, we had a PMI in the US, 57 last week. We had the biggest manufacturer in the world, China. Um, was it 28% uh, export growth, you know, last month? Uh, we've had better retail sales. I mean, I think there's every data point out there tells you that the sort of bearish just on growth, whether it's economic growth or earnings growth, is, is, is misplaced. And secondly, um, you know, the other sort of hand-wringing is all that inflation pressure, and you're just not seeing it. This is going to be another quarter of all-time high margins. And basically, that, the top-line growth is more than offsetting uh, any pressure that some companies are seeing at the margin level. Ben, how do you adjust for the word stagflation? Mentally, how do you stay committed to a double-digit call on total return given stagflation gloom? I don't think you're going to see it. If anything, actually, I think markets may, you know, have, have sort of over-discounted this a little bit, um, and that sort of sets us up for, you know, positive catalyst, you know, down the line. I mean, the market's been very quick to price out uh, interest rate hikes by the Fed in the in the middle of next year. We'll see whether that actually happens or not. But you know the, the message from central banks that have hiked interest rates this year, and there've been actually quite a lot of them, is when they actually do hike, markets go up. You know there's a there's a relief that they're dealing with inflation. There's a relief that they finally moved after we've discounted it. And I think that's what we've been set up for by the Fed, not only with interest rates but also with tapering when it starts next month. And we've been talking about this. Sort of ad nauseum. I mean, let's just get on with it, get it out of the way. And I think actually think the markets will move on from that. There's an issue, though, of inflation and whether this is something that the Fed or other central banks can actually address. And I think of the oil complex, the idea here that higher oil prices are being viewed as a Rorschach test. Either it represents higher demand because the world's reopening or it represents uh, people not getting their drills up to speed. How do you view this as we see crude climb to the highest since 2014? So, so I think the commodity rally, at least relative to inflation, is a bit of a red herring. I think we all underestimate how decommoditized uh, economies have become over, you know, in recent decades. I mean, manufacturing is what 12 percent of uh, of U.S. Uh, GDP right now. You know, direct impact on the inflation basket. You know, three four percent. 
Um, so, you know, it's clearly not helpful in the sort of broader narrative, broader discussion we're having, the reflection <clears throat> pressures everywhere, not just uh, in the commodity space. But, you know, that's not, uh, you know, that's not overdo it. Um, and, you know, again, I think markets are pricing some of this in, certainly on the Fed curve and also uh, in inflation yeah. sort of expectations. I think that's all well and good. But I think to go from there to sort of stagflation, I mean, back in the 70s, your sort of misery index of unemployment plus inflation was, what, 22 percent? Yeah. Right now we're at 10. And if you believe the forecast, this is the peak, right? Who knows whether it is or not, but we're a very, very, very long way from stagflation. And I think that's a, a leap of faith that right. I don't think investors don't want to be making right now. John, this is what happens when you're as large as Ben Laidler and you get the market dead on three years in a row. You start drilling early in the morning just to get the East Wing built out. He's just upset a little. someone in it's the like building, 5, hasn't he? It's 5,000 square feet or something he's expanding <laughs> out. Ben, I'm told we've got some audio issues. We've got to let you run. Great to catch up, as always. Ben Laidler there of eToro. The big five tech firms reporting this week. Bloomberg Intelligence looking for 19% growth across the five of them, Tom. I did not know that. 19%. You're a Where did you find that on the Bloomberg? From Bloomberg Intelligence, You're Tom. You're a font BI. of wisdom. BI, the font of wisdom, Tom. I just regurgitate what they've got to say. Some big numbers coming this week. Okay. Yeah, big, you know, I'll, all right? I'll go with it. But, John, <laughs> he's, he's you know, John, this is one. serious, serious. Sure. iPhone sales. Anurag Rana with Bloomberg Intelligence weeks ago said, hey, stupid, they're up 6.5%. Somebody else came out, maybe it was Wedbush, uh, Dan Ives, he said 10%. The answer is we don't know, given all the supply worry, 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 worry. You know what, I think, that, you know, it'll be interesting to see. Is We're ben, pretty familiar, ben, Tom, with the demand side of the story. <clears throat> Lisa, it'd be interesting to see what happens with supply. Yeah, so listening fair. to the earlier show this morning with Francine Lacqua interviewing the ITV nice boss. Yeah. Big advertising business there over at ITV, a network, TV network in the UK. And Lisa saying that the car advertisers had pulled back pulled back. Why? Because they don't want the incremental demand, do they? No, because that's, they can't meet it. And frankly, that's what we saw with Snap, right, last week. The idea is how much does this sort of uh, give a sense of what we should expect with Facebook? And what happens if Facebook disappoints on that, too, given uh, what Google's revenue looks like? Facebook, Snap. a little bit later. Tom, do you want to talk about Manchester United now? Or <laughs> no, 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 no I save on seconds. that. You're better at that than me. <laughs> Just giving him a small window. We can do that later, Tom. I lost my Small field goal to save Pretty miserable. Join us on that and on the Die race market that. too. <laughs> Joining us from TD, <laughs> 7 a.m. Eastern time from New York City this morning. Fresh. Good you. morning to you all. Getting the trading <laughs> week started with futures positive a tenth of one percent. This is Bloomberg. With the first word news, I'm Laura Wright. China is warning that new COVID-19 infections will increase in the coming days after the latest outbreak, which is fueled by the Delta variant, expanded to 11 provinces in lockdown hundreds of thousands of people in the north asking them to stay home. Officials are warning of civil and criminal penalties for anyone disobeying the order. UK Chancellor Rishi Sunak is set to announce almost £6 billion for the National Health Service at this week's government budget. The boost as the UK attempts to clear backlogs caused by the pandemic is one of a few major giveaways likely in Wednesday's financial statement. Sunak's task is complicated by a stuttering economic recovery, faster inflation and a surge in virus cases. Turkey's lira fell to a record today amid the country's ongoing diplomatic spat. Already under pressure following a larger-than-expected rate cut last week, the currency slid again today after President Erdogan said the ambassadors of 10 nations, including the US, Germany and France, were no longer welcome. The countries are demanding the release of a prominent businessman and philanthropist. PayPal says it is not pursuing an acquisition of Pinterest, ending days of speculation over a potential $45 billion deal. Last week, Bloomberg News reported PayPal had approached Pinterest about a potential deal. An acquisition of Pinterest, a visual search and scrapbooking platform, would have boosted PayPal's ambitions to become the next global super app. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries, this is Bloomberg. We've 90% of the bill agreed to and written. We just have some of the last uh, decisions to be made. We probably will have a wealth tax. I wouldn't call that a wealth tax, but um, it would help get at uh, capital gains, which um, are an extraordinarily large part 
of the incomes of the wealthiest individuals and uh, right now uh, escaped. How do you tax unrealized gains? House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, both on CNN over the weekend. From New York City this morning, good morning. Tom Keane, Lisa Brabitz and Jonathan Ferro. Your equity market up six on the S&P, advancing a little more than a tenth of 1%. Yields higher by a couple of basis points to 165.37. Crude positive nine tenths of 1%, 84.53. Mm. Tom, how do you tax unrealized gains? That's, That's the conversation right on. now. Dead on. Greg Vallier kills it this morning with a list of reasons here, the desperation that we see in Washington. Emily Wilkins joins us right now with Bloomberg at Government. Let's take an image, folks, of $110 million. It's a Monet. It's the only private haystack of the acclaimed Lemules of the, uh, the Monet series. And all you need to know is it's just what John Farrell just described. It's just simply a painting that, well, it's intangible. Or maybe it's very tangible and you can't tax it at that. Emily Wilkins, how is Speaker Pelosi going to tax whoever owns this Monet? That is a great question, and that's something that Democrats are under a lot of pressure to figure out this week. Now that it seems like raising the corporate tax rate as well as raising various incomes are off the table, Democrats are <clears throat> scrambling to find other ways to make up for the revenue to pay for Joe Biden's social spending and tax plan. Because remember, as we're seeing inflation concerns go up today, Democrats are trying to make it very, very right. clear that whatever spending package they pass will be paid for. So this revenue stuff is incredibly critical to figure out. Explain the process of taxing X number of billionaires. There's this billionaire, that billionaire, there's John Farrell, the rest of them. I get it. But how do you actually go through a legislative process to pick on, I'm going to guess, 200 people? For Democrats, what they're looking at right now, reportedly, is those who are making more than either $1 billion per year oh, or my. making more than $100 million over three consecutive years, and that they would be subject to another income tax. That's one of the options that they're looking at. They're also looking at bolstering the IRS as far as making sure that they can really look and do a thorough review of individuals. That's getting a lot of criticism from Republicans, though, who say that they're just emboldening the IRS to really examine the average American's spending and taxes. Is this so the lots of options on the table right now. Not a lot of clarity ex ex at this point on what options Democrats will be choosing. Emily, was this the main topic of discussion at the breakfast yesterday in Delaware with Senators Manchin and Schumer, as well as President Biden? We know that it had to be one of them, but that's not the only thing right now in this bill that's up for debate. Climate is a huge, huge piece of this. Remember, one of the reasons that President Biden is pushing so hard to get this bill done now is so he'll have something to take to that U.N. climate summit meeting. And the main part of the the main climate piece of the bill, the clean energy plan, that is now out of the legislation. And so Democrats are trying to think of another way to reduce emissions by 50 percent by the year 2030 without that piece of the plan in there. So once again, a lot of stuff going on. Speaker Nancy Pelosi said they're 90 percent of the way there. But that other 10 percent, that includes a lot of things that need to be decided on before the end of the week. Emily, this feels like whack-a-mole. It's sort of pick your topic and there's going to be disagreement on it. And when you get agreement on that one, there's going to be disagreement on something else. How do you view progress other than listening to Nancy Pelosi saying 90 percent, 80 percent there? Uh, how do you actually judge whether they're moving forward? Well, we know right now that the main goal is to get from that $3.5 trillion number to a smaller number, more in the field of about $2 trillion. And so to hear things like we heard last week, that tuition-free community <clears throat> college is out, that the child care tax credit is only going to be extended for a year, to hear Democrats say exactly what some of these cuts are going to be suggests that there is progress being made over that final goal of trimming down the bill. But as you point out, there's still a lot that's left to do. And not well, a very long time to do it. I, I, this is an unfair question, Emily, but it's unfair Monday. Uh, what's your working number right now on the social legislation? Are you at $1.9 trillion, or are you north or south of that? When you talk to lawmakers, you do hear a lot of different numbers in that range. You hear 1.75, you hear 1.9, you hear you? 2 trillion. 
I, I mean, uh, look, I, I just I just talk to the people and ask them what, what they're thinking of at this point. But I mean, it, it is going to be hard. I mean, the, you see how much people value various provisions in the bill, how difficult it is to do things like scale back on Medicare expansion to reduce paid family leave from 12 weeks to four weeks. I mean, those decisions aren't even in stone. And we're already hearing people come out very strongly against them. And so it seems like the lower that Democrats go, the more they risk infuriating their base, which they're trying to boost through passing this legislation. Uh, so at, at this point, it seems like it's going to be the lower they go, the more difficult it's going to be for lawmakers. Emily, thank you. Got to leave it there. Emily Wilkins there down in D.C. <laughs> Talking about isolating the base, maybe. Let's talk about the independence, Tom. This came from a Gallup poll on Friday. Currently, 34 percent of independents approve of the, of the job Joe Biden is doing. The lowest of his term to date, his approval among independents has fallen a total of 21 points since June, including nine yeah. points since August. The president, Tom, struggling with independence. Well, I'm glad you bring it up because, to be fair, folks, uh, with the previous administration, we looked at the polls on what, John, an hourly basis? Maybe we took off 11 a.m. not to look at them. But this, you know, this guy has had a different scrutiny of polling than maybe the previous guy. And struggling and, right now, Tom. And it's good of you to bring it up to show that dynamic. It matters. Increasingly so. Struggling, Lisa, yeah. in the polls as they try and refocus this effort down in Washington. Do you think that's what it is, though? I mean, how much is it the oil price? How much is it the idea that inflation seems to be ticking up and that perhaps some of the uh, earlier spending was part of a contributing factor to this? I mean, this is sort of the picture that we're looking at that is so difficult to decipher. Is this a feeling that he can't get anything done in Washington, or is it also a reflection <clears throat> of the sentiment surveys, which have come in really spotty, this yeah. idea of people feeling the price of milk, the price Don, of gas, the price of housing? And speaking of struggling in the polls, can you explain how the Manchester United coach still has his job yeah i don't know tom i, I, I mean seriously i mean this guy's a nice it was guy right brutal he's like it a was ted brutal. lasso guy tom do you know what's captured that perfectly <clears throat> it was a picture of sir alex ferguson looking absolutely miserable and then the next shot on nbc tom just showed kenny hey. dalgleish liverpool legend laughing his face off serious that score john line. seriously is the, and I can't pronounce his name. I'm so sorry, with no disrespect. John, the, the good Solskjaer. coach of Man U. Yeah. Is he the closest to Ted Lasso in soccer? No, Tom, he's not. And I don't think he'd appreciate that this morning, though. I'm sure some Manchester United fans feel that way. Tom, that club has got problems. Big, big issues. And that team has got bigger issues as well. Harry Maguire's worth how much? I, I don't know. Too much? I don't know. That defensive performance of him and Shaw... Did you see the ridiculous. corner kick West Ham scored on? I, I saw some of the goals over the weekend, Tom. What was Harry Kane you doing? You upset about Spurs. He wasn't yeah. defending, Tom. He was not defending Thank his man. Thank you. Should have marked him that better. Was, it was poetry. Is that the football Steve done Major for this morning? Steve Major emailed me. Steve's happy. Steve, he was, it was poetry, I said. In a Champions League race now for West Ham. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. Did I do okay there, John? Three weeks of gains on the S&P 500 from New York City this morning. Good morning. Live on TV and radio. This is Bloomberg Surveillance and here's the price action. Equity futures just a little bit firmer. Up six, advancing a little more than a tenth of one percent on the Nasdaq. Up a quarter of one percent on the Russell. We're down about a tenth of one percent. The big five tech firms reporting through the week. We'll hear from Facebook a little bit later. That's the equity market picture. Here's the bond market story. Twos, tens and thirties shaping up as follows. Yields higher now after a big move lower on tens and thirties on Friday after we heard from Chairman Powell. Up by two basis points to 165.55, up about three on 30s to let's call it 2.1%. But that front end now, very little pushback from Chairman Powell on Friday seems to be the takeaway from the likes of Neil Dutter of Renmac. We can build out that through the program this morning. They're starting to push out this transitory call now. Transitory for longer is getting to be something we hear a little bit more of, Tom. Something maybe people are getting increasingly frustrated <clears throat> with hearing. That's the bond market. Switch up the board and get to the Turkish lira. Tom, your favourite currency pair, dollar oh. try, all-time highs. Yeah. That's record weakness for the Turkish lira. 1.4% move in the dollar's favour, Tom. Very quickly here. It's about Turkey, John. I get that. It's idiosyncratic, but then it's not. It's about the political projection of Erdogan back to 2002 in the Levant, his view of modern Middle East. And then it's a projection where you go, when does it become contagion? We're not there Tom, yet. Tom, take your pick right now. They cleared out the central bank. One. 
they cut when everyone else is hiking, too. And now they're clearing out the ambassadors, it seems, Tom. Yeah. Dollar Lira weekend. with another big move, yeah, 974. Yeah, yeah. Are you done? I'm done. Okay, well, this you is ready? fun. <laughs> I'm so ready, I can't stand it. This is really important, folks. It's 220 pages, and for the first time in ages, I'm going to say it's a cover-to-cover -cover read. Foreign Affairs magazine, Dan Kurtz Phelan joins us right now. It's on his wheelhouse, China, and it is absolutely spectacular. Let's get to it, uh, Dan. Congratulations. And let me start with my essay of the year by Dr. Bremer of Eurasia Group. He sits there and folds in the technology companies into your international relations. Explain the international relations of Amazon. That's right. So, so Ian Bremmer's contribution here is not just to point out what we all know, which is that tech companies are hugely important, that they're major actors in shaping the world, but they've really risen to the point where they are like states themselves. And what this means is that when you look at the big players, not just Amazon and Alphabet and Facebook and the American players, but also uh, the big Chinese tech companies, the big tech companies elsewhere, which model of tech company wins out in shaping cyberspace is really uh, going to determine the geopolitical future, not just the future of technology. So it's become a very different game. You went for sales. You put Mearsheimer in the book, and you're always going to move more copies of Foreign Affairs. A gentleman who went after NATO and went after continental Europe as they, they faced Russia a decade ago. He's scathing here on the U.S. approach to, client, to uh, China and says the United States is ignoring realist logic. How realist is the Biden administration? John Mearsheimer loves to go after what he sees as the big mistakes of American strategy and American foreign policy over time. What's really remarkable in this essay where he looks back at US-China strategy over the past several decades, he calls this the biggest strategic mistake we've made in the history of America's time as a great power. What he sees is this mistake of thinking that China would become more liberal, more, uh, more acquiescent, more like the United States. Instead, as we all know now, the, the opposite has happened. It's become more assertive. Its political system has not liberalized. And Xi Jinping has proved to be a, uh, the most kind of assertive Chinese leader since Mao. The Biden administration, as we can see, and Richard Haas's essay makes this point, has really kind of extended the recognition that started probably late Obama and then really under President Trump, the the idea of China as our main competitor and in some ways the kind of um, uh, focal point of American foreign policy of the Biden administration's China policy has been very tough, very assertive, uh, very hawkish in some ways. And that's been a, a change in American foreign policy that really goes across both parties. We talk about you know partisanship in Washington, but this is probably the most bipartisan policy we have today. What's the goal then, Dan, if this is the new approach uh, for a longer period of time, especially at a time when the trade deficit continues to deepen between the U.S. and China? So you're asking the million dollar question. We've decided that we need to be tougher. We've decided that this is the central challenge for American foreign policy. But both parties have really struggled to figure out where we go from here. So if we think about what an end state is with China, the Chinese Communist Party is probably not going to go away. Xi Jinping is probably going to be in power for some time to come. We're still going to have to cooperate with China on issues like climate change. We're, of course, approaching this massive UN climate change uh, conference in, in Glasgow in a, in a few days. So we need to find a way to coexist in this world, even while from the perspective of US foreign policy, you're able to push back on some of these very worrying things that you see from China, its own region, within its own borders, and globally. So there's this ongoing quest to figure out where this all goes, what 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 goal we are aiming for. And I would say that, you know, that's that's a question we'll be trying to figure out in our pages over time. It's also a question that policymakers in the US government and the Biden administration and beyond are going to be, are going to be really grappling with. Well, the goal for the Facebook uh, state and the state of Amazon is quite clear. It's to make money. And we do see this increasing shift into China, despite some of the hardened policy from the United States, as you were talking about earlier. How does the U.S. or how should the U.S. respond in terms of regulating the U.S. business interest over in the China mainland? So, so th this is one of the most interesting elements of that Ian Bremmer essay. This, this notion that these tech companies are both critical to national power, right? If you look at U.S.-China competition, one huge piece of that is who's going to have the technological edge when it comes to everything from AI uh, to, um, uh, to quantum computing to cyber tools. 
And as we all know, the private sector actors are really, really central in that. So even at this moment when these private companies, the ones you mentioned, as well as many Chinese companies that have become really, really major global presences in various uh, tech sectors, even as they become these huge private sector players, when we talk about US-China competition, when we talk about US power, a lot of that comes down to who's developing technology mm -hmm. faster, who's developing AI and quantum computing and everything else. Yeah, and it'd be unfair if I didn't ask you of your knowledge back to George Marshall in China of another time and place. Give us the Kurtzfalen once over on Taiwan as it stands now. How should the United States project a modern George Marshall to Taiwan and to mainland China? Well, th thank you, Tom, for bringing up George Marshall, which is a topic I spent um, many years of my life working on. When you look at, at Marshall's approach to China, it was all about balance. So you needed to be, um, in some ways, tough and clear and strong, but also needed to be really aware of risks and limits and, and balance those two things. And that's exactly what the U.S. is trying to do in Taiwan today. We can see that uh, China has become uh, much more aggressive, at least in its rhetoric, when it comes to Taiwan, when it comes to to reunification with Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. is trying to, on the one hand, project uh, project strength and project a certain commitment, but without going so far as to uh, increase tensions even more or encourage risky behavior by others. So it really is this really fine right. balance. And it's a very dangerous situation. And you can see if you have Chinese, uh, Chinese planes right. in the Taiwan Strait, you have all these commitments. It could escalate really, really quickly. You are advantaged by Elizabeth Economy at the Council on Foreign Relations. She was shockingly prescient a number of years ago of the domestic challenges to President Xi. Why has Xi not left home? From where you sit and with all your contacts, is President Xi threatened by domestic affairs? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to tell you, Tom, that we'll have an essay from Liz Economy in our next issue, which will get at some of these questions. Well, get us out front now. But Farrell's already I, I, Farrell's I, I, on I, I, will get, I, will, I will give you a preview. We, from, from outside, it's easy to see Xi Jinping as this just incredibly powerful leader who has this hold on Chinese power on Chinese government in a way that we haven't seen in a very long time. But when you look at the just array of threats to his power, whether it's demographics, it's environmental stuff, but some of the threats to the Chinese economy, I mean, you would uh, uh, know, know some of those dimensions better than I, he's got a lot of reason to worry. So he's going into his own uh, party Congress next year, trying to secure his own power for another five-year term. But he's got a lot to deal with at home. And you can imagine why, if you're sitting in his position, you'd feel a lot of insecurity as you try to reckon with some of those threats. Hey, Dan, great to catch up. Important topic at the end there, too. Dan Kurtz feeling there of foreign affairs. Tom, I believe the Chinese Communist Party leader has not left the country since Wuhan was locked down. It's been a while. Yeah, well, it's a city-state structure there. I, you know, I studied it over the years, John, for uh, a number of different reasons. But the bottom line is he needs the support of Shanghai. He needs the support of the cities surrounding Hong Kong and on and on. And there's other cities that I can't uh, pronounce. The bottom line, John, is it's very different than our federal view of the red doors in Beijing. Capturing that story to some degree, Tom, just a small part of it. There was a report in the Wall Street Journal over the last couple mm -hmm. of weeks that... Xi Jinping would like a property tax, and there's been pushback within the party. And that's just a little sign, yeah. Tom, that the leader of the <clears throat> Communist Party in China doesn't always get his way. But can I also suggest, John, it folds right into this week for Bloomberg surveillance, and that you wonder how these big tech companies are going to address China, not only for demand, sales and that, yep. but the manufacture of their product with Taiwan Semiconductor front and center. Depends what their presence is. Facebook will have a very different view to, say, yeah. Apple for very I was reasons. just trying to pull international relations back I into saw John, that, what Tom. we do. We can, do, I do, that, okay we can do that a little bit more if you want. <clears throat> Prime Minister I'm, Boris Johnson, Tom, saying he's worried the COP26 climate summit may not secure the agreement he wants on cutting emissions. No one's shocked by that line, <clears throat> are they, Tom? Well, that conference taking well, place at the end of this month. And we're setting up for this now, John. And, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I did a panel on COP26 X number of years ago at Davos, and it was, it was a jumble there, and I think it's even more a jumble now. Managing the message this morning, Tom, a week <laughs> out. From New York City this morning, good morning. Tom Keane, Lisa I Abramitz, did, and I Jonathan Ferrer. the three of us in Glasgow. Tom trying to arrange another step on the European tour. Another stop, Tom, this time in Scotland.
Equity futures up six on the S&P, up a little more than a tenth of 1%. Three weeks of gains we look to add Tell to it. It's like $5,000 a night. In and around all-time highs on the S&P. From New York City, this is Bloomberg. With the first red news, I'm Laura Wright. West Virginia Democratic Senator Joe Manchin appears to be on board with the White House proposals for new taxes on billionaires and certain corporations to help pay for President Biden's scaled back social services and climate change package. CNN is reporting Manchin is OK with a $1.75 trillion package. That follows a meeting on Sunday between President Biden, Manchin and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer at the president's home in Delaware. U.S. labor shortages will persist into 2022 and contribute to a permanent increase in business costs. That's according to the latest survey by the National Association for Business Economics. Some 36% of respondents currently experiencing worker shortages said they expect them to end at some point next year. None see it happening before the end of 2021. 14% see shortages abating in 2023 or later. HSBC is outlining a bullish outlook for the months ahead, fueled by likely increases in the interest rates. The London-based lender also said today it will soon kick off a higher-than-expected share buyback. Adjusted pre-tax profit rose to around $6 billion in the third quarter, beating estimates. Revenue climbed slightly in the third quarter for the first time in almost two years. And Michael Jordan's earliest known regular season game-worn Nike shoes sold at Sotheby's auction in Las Vegas Sunday for $1.47 million. Jordan wore the shoes in his fifth NBA game during his rookie season in 1984. They're the most expensive sneakers ever sold at auction, but not the priciest shoes ever sold. In April, the company Rares bought a $1.8 million pair of Kanye West Nike Air Yeezy One sneakers. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. What really shouldn't be confusing, all three products, the mix and match means that under the situation, if you were originally vaccinated with one product, could you and would it be appropriate and safe and effective to get boosted in the third shot for the mRNA and the second shot for J&J &J by another product? And the answer is it's perfectly fine. Dr. Fauci on ABC over the weekend from New York City this morning. Good morning. Tom Keane, Lisa Bramitz and Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market up six on the S&P, up a little more than a tenth of one percent. Into the bond market, yields are higher after travelling lower through Friday's session, much lower. 165.55 on tens. It is the blackout period for the Federal Reserve. There will be no Fed speak this week. I know you're all happy about that. You will get a Fed decision, Tom next week, November 3rd, and a Chairman Pound News Conference too. Next week, going into our special programming for that event, it will be most, most interesting. John, we've got to note Brent crude above $86 a barrel. I believe that's closer to 90 than $84 Keep a barrel. Keep picking up. WTI, $84.50, Tom, $84.40. Yeah. <clears throat> On the pandemic right now, I'm going to dovetail two stories here. There is the joy, the true joy from Canada as they announce coming up here very shortly, all kinds of travel can reoccur, including going to see the Montreal Canadiens try uh, to win again. And then dovetail that with the vaccination of our cherubs. That is very emotional. Joshua Sharfstein joins us right now by Steen Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Mr. Bloomberg has a nodding acquaintance with his TV and radio network. And, of course, his philanthropy is, too his John Hopkins University. Dr. Sharfstein, I, I look at this, and as you mentioned as we were going to air here, it is about a gaining of confidence. We get confidence when we see Canada truly open up. We learn confidence when we do something new in vaccination, such as our cherubs. That's right. And, you know, in general, the projections that cases would go down are coming true, and we hope that That'll continue. Um, and, you know, that's what the projections show. Um, the question is how low they'll go. And that will depend really on how many people get vaccinated and uh, on whether people can take precautions if, in places where the cases are going up. Do we need a new messenger for all of this? Tough question to put to you, sir. But do you think Tony Fauci, Dr. Fauci, is helping when he's in the media every single weekend saying the same thing? Do you think that helps at the moment? 
I think there are a lot of people who come to to rely on him. I think people would be a little anxious if if suddenly he didn't show up on TV to explain, you know, what is going on. I also think there are other very good messengers, including Dr. Walensky at CDC, you know, who are able to explain what's happening. In general, I think um, it would probably be helpful to be talking a little bit ahead about what things are coming. Um, and I think they've done a little better job of that as the pediatric vaccine is approached. But what I think is going to be really important is explaining not just the decision for the pediatric vaccine, but how additional data will be quickly uh, gathered so that people who are reluctant initially are able to get questions answered. Dr. Sharfstein, how important is tomorrow's FDA meeting? I think it's pretty important because, you know, I think in this country, we don't do so well if people just announce things without really explaining them. I think some of the challenges we've had this year are because things have been announced before they've been explained. One of the advantages of an advisory committee is that people talk over the data, they talk about different things, and that informs journalists, it informs people who are watching really carefully. But more generally, it just it just kind of creates this idea that We've really looked at the data before we're making a decision to go forward. And I think I think that'll be helpful. And again, I think a key point is that it's not a point in time decision. It's a current you know, decision, which I think will likely be to move forward. But um, at the same time, they'll be collecting more data um, as that happens and as many, many kids start to get vaccinated. Increasingly, the question will be, what is the new normal that we should be comfortable with? And I say this as certain banks start to pressure Hong Kong to move away from their zero COVID policies to actually reopen their borders, even if they see a couple of cases. What is the appropriate new normal that we should be looking toward and when do we get there? Well, I think, um, you know, we're starting to get there in a lot of parts of the world. Even New Zealand is making plans or starting to open up with high levels of vaccination. Um, you know, I think for for me, you know, I, I'm going back to school. I teach in person. Uh, we still have uh, masks inside the school of public health. Um, but as the number of cases in the community goes down um, and as the vaccine continues to hold up, um, those I, uh, precautions might also go away. So I think we need a little bit more flexibility in the new normal, recognizing when there is a surge in the community, we should do more. And I think masks are going to be a little bit like umbrellas. There'll be periods of time where it really does make sense to wear a mask, and that, that may be even to protect us against flu. Where we have hot spots, are we having lesser hot spots now? Um, in general, yes, although there are certainly some places. I was reading about Minnesota, uh, parts of Minnesota. I mean, this is a virus that will find the places that are unvaccinated. And uh, if those places don't have a lot of hospitals, um, then you're going to see um, a real uh, health care crisis. And, and that is continuing to happen at a small scale. I think so many people got Delta over the summer um, that we're, we've been spared that a little bit in the places that were already hit hard. Um, but uh, you know, we don't know exactly what's happening with the virus. It may be mutating a little bit more. And so I, I think really until we have a very high percentage of people vaccinated, um, there's going to be this risk and we're, and we're going to have to remain flexible. Doctor, thank you, as always, for your time. Joshua Shastin there of Johns Hopkins. Tom, mm -hmm. Beijing, the focus here, China more broadly, I think for a lot of people waking up, thinking about supply side issues and thinking about the pandemic as well. The capital, Beijing, has all but banned entry by people arriving from any yeah. place in the country that's reported locally transmitted COVID cases. The restrictions, well, Tom, are tighter. It is dead on that you do this, John, because we're seeing Canada open up. We're seeing some real successes where we live uh, as well in the hotspots just mentioned by Dr. Sharstein. But the rest of the world is a completely different story with national hotspots and then, you know, every, it's almost every nation for itself, I'd say. So let's get to the economics debate right now. Secretary Yellen has said that these issues will get better perhaps by the middle of next year. Lisa, a lot of that's going to be pinned on, say, one country and things getting better in places like China, never mind the domestic story at the ports in California here in America. The idea that their policy with respect to COVID is becoming international debate, the idea of zero COVID, that they don't want to see anything, that one death is one death too many uh, on Hong Kong and in the mainland. How do you then dovetail this into supply chains getting evened out? How do you get this into a, a, an economy that's that much more hinged on importing goods? Look, there was a recent NABE survey that showed that no uh, business expected these issues to dissipate this year. Have you noticed that the messaging has changed, just shifted a little bit? 
from Secretary Yellen, from yes, Chairman Powell, Tom. I did notice Have that. you noticed that? It's just been pushed out <clears throat> just a little bit more. They're pushing out this conversation to the middle of next year. What happened now, to year end? What happened I, to as the year progresses? I, now we're talking about yeah, 22. Exactly. I went back and forth with Dr. Larian this morning over at the University of Cambridge, and John, the basic idea is their sole single solution is to push it out, as you say. There's no other history. Read your Meltzer, read your Timberlake, read your Friedman and Schwartz. Push it out, push it out. Does the T word still work? <clears throat> I don't think it, it does, Tom. <laughs> Tom the T word is going into the grave of a V-shaped bottom. Lisa Bramitz. <laughs> Jonathan Farrow. Are you okay there? That was beautiful. Gorgeous. Poetry, That's Tom. Before you were on air. That was poetry. <clears throat> Thank you. Up two basis points. You're still live. 165 on tens from New York. This is Bloomberg. Inflation goes to the point where the Fed has to raise rates, they're out. If the stock market corrects, they're not coming back. Yes, inflation is a focus, but the market has priced a good amount of that. What markets are pricing in at the moment is an acceleration of the Fed hiking cycle. The inflation expectations are rising, and what they need to do is manage those expectations. Rising interest rates is a sign of confidence in the economy, not a problem for stocks. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. From New York City, for our audience worldwide, good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Live on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market up five on the S&P, advancing a tenth of one percent. This week, Tom, we've got to put the obsession with the Fed to one side and focus on big tech. I'm going to focus on big tech, John, and really the headline I had at last hour as well is not only earnings surprising of 117 companies, John Stolfus at Opco nails it with the idea that revenue are double digit, John. They're not nominal GDP, six, seven percent. So far, we see another quarter of pretty darn good sales growth. We don't have some good headlines, though, Tom, on Facebook. Here's one for you. Alarmed by the drop in teen usage, leaving investors in the dark. A big story, Tom, that we've just put out in the last couple of minutes, at least the stock is negative about 1%. Yeah, the idea here that teenagers are starting to spend a lot less time on Facebook. This comes among the drumbeat of disclosures from Francis Hogan, which we have seen uh, to sort of bleed out here. The idea, what is the future for a Facebook that has been at the center of discourse for the United States that has frankly remained out of the purview of regulators for so long? Just want to get to our story, Tom, and read it verbatim for you. In March, a group of researchers inside Facebook compiled a report for one of the company's most powerful executives, the chief product officer, Chris Cox. The paper concluded or included a series of charts and data highlighting a troubling trend that seemed to be accelerating. Facebook was losing popularity with teens and young adults, Tom. Some of the reporting here at Bloomberg this morning. Did they go to Instagram? That's what I observe at home, John. I mean, I really wonder what the lose-lose sum total is here for Facebook. I mean, it's very, it's, it, it, it's very good research here. This idea from Kurt Wagner and David McLaughlin as well. But I just see, I, 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 I'm sorry, I, I just... I, where did they go? They went to Facebook. We see that at the Keene household. Well, here are the numbers. One colorful graphic showed that time spent for U.S. teenagers on Facebook was down 16% year over year and that young adults in the U.S. were also spending 5% less time on a social network. Happy to say that joining us now is Bloomberg's Paul Sweeney. Morning, Paul. More bad news, it seems. A toxic atmosphere. It's been reported on a lot over the last several months. In fact, the last several years for this company, Paul. What are we learning this morning? Yeah, it's, it's a big issue, I think, uh, for this company. When you think about these social media companies, uh, you know, the real proposition they provide for their advertisers is we're going to give you a big audience, and they do. There are billions of people across all the Facebook platforms, and we're going to give you a lot of engagement. That is, our audience spends a lot of time on our platforms, whether it's Facebook or Instagram uh, or eventually WhatsApp. So to the extent that uh, a certain demographic, like teens, are spending less time uh, with one of their platforms, in this case Facebook, that's an issue. Uh, that goes to their ability to generate uh, advertising revenue. So, you know, this is something that's going to, I think, be an issue for this company going forward. They're really going to have to manage their way through it with their advertising partners. But, boy, you look at the stock, it's up 18 or 19 percent this year, generally in line with uh, NASDAQ. So it yeah. hasn't been that big of an issue yet. But 
Uh, you got to feel like this is pretty fundamental to the core of their business. Eight years uh, track record, Paul Sweeney. They're up a slurry soft 26% <laughs> per year. Ian Bremmer in Foreign Affairs is my essay of the year of the power of Facebook, the power of Amazon, the power of big tech. Does anybody at Facebook's headquarters, I don't even know where it's located, but, you know, does anybody at Facebook's headquarters give a damn what the media says about their demographics and dynamics? I think they do. I think they do. Again, they're, uh, they're dependent upon advertisers, and to the extent an advertiser doesn't necessarily want to be associated with your platform, that could be an issue. Okay, but they go over to Instagram. Uh, they go over to the Instagram, but again, again, that could be an issue as well because I think what a lot of folks don't understand is that Instagram obviously is owned by uh, Facebook, but it's not necessarily out there in the zeitgeist, but to the extent that it does become a, a bigger issue, this is something that I think they need to get a handle on. Them. And the current management team you know, doesn't seem to have the ability to really get ahead of this uh, very much. They don't perform that well in front of the uh, representatives down in in, in Washington, D.C., uh, so I think that's going to be an issue for them. So um, if you're Facebook, you'd like to think you can get in front of this because it goes to your core uh, proposition for your business proposition, which is really uh, mm -hmm. to advertisers delivering a huge audience with a big engagement, and that's kind of been the story here. And so if you're an, an advertiser, it's kind of a duopoly, a triopoly. You've kind of got Facebook, you've got Google, uh, maybe Amazon a little bit. But you're kind of left with Facebook and all the properties they have. Paul, what do people want to hear from Mark Zuckerberg today after the bell when they deliver their third quarter earnings? Well, I think they're going to want to hear that they've got a, you know, a handle on their business and that they are, in fact, allocating a lot of resources and trying their very best to deal with these issues. And there is a myriad of issues um, you know, as it relates to data privacy, um, hate speech, uh, obviously the elections coming up again are going to be a big issue for this company. When it first happened, i.e. Facebook was really linked to uh, some election misinformation and then the January 6th, you know, the response from Facebook is we're going to hire 10,000 additional people. We're going to allocate billions of dollars of technology to root these issues out. And here we are a couple uh, years later and we still have these issues. So whatever they have done, it has not been enough. And I think what investors are going to want to hear, or what I think society is going to want to hear is, what else are you going to do? What more can you do? Small stock drop right now, Paul. Thank you, sir. Down about 1.1%. Paul Sweeney coming up a little <coughs> bit later. Don't miss that on Bloomberg Radio at 9 a.m. Eastern time alongside Tom Keen. Coming up on this program, we'll catch up with Michael Nathanson on Facebook, the senior research analyst, Tom, at Moffitt. Nathanson on this stock that, as you point out, Tom, is doing okay, regardless I, of this broader I'm toxic sorry. conversation. I, you know, I want to talk to Michael Nathanson, John, about what matters, which is Netflix and streaming. Paul Sweeney has been so far out front on what we're doing with streaming, what are we watching, do we have reach John, we don't have ratings on this stuff. What matters, Tom, for Facebook is ad spend. That's what I want to talk about. Yeah, that's fair. Are the advertiser's yes. going to look at this and say, OK, there's a problem with the data, and we didn't understand that, we weren't told, are they going to pull back? Because John, every time, Tom, we have this conversation, <clears throat> the ad spend hasn't pulled back. Okay, Lisa, I mean, Not I, in this, anyway. I don't want to take a lot of time here, but, John, it's simple. Do you know anybody on Facebook? I mean, I don't use it. Anymore, I, I don't know anybody. I think who it's uses your demo Facebook. now. I think that's what the story is. Yeah, okay. Yeah, great. To. Quick, get my walker. I've got to go over and check into Facebook. Lisa, do you? <clears throat> no. No. There. Enough. But honestly, I don't use Instagram either. So there you go. So, Tom, it's, we're, we're going to base whether we carry, cover a conversation <laughs> based on whether you, no. John, or Lisa, or I actually look, use the Priya product. Misra, John, Priya Agreed. Misra spends eight hours a day on Facebook. Yeah, right. She joins us now on rates <laughs> and not on Facebook. <laughs> Priya Misra, Global Head of Race Strategy at TD <clears throat> Securities. Priya, you can escape this one. It's the Fed blackout period. The chairman had the last word, the final word. What did we learn from Chairman Powell, Priya? So I think he's managing expectations here that inflation, even though they haven't really pulled back from the talk of transitory, notice that he didn't bring it up at all. I think they're telling us that inflation supply chain issues are going to last for a while. He didn't talk about hiking sooner, though. So I think if the, the, the market has repriced the hiking cycle significantly. And what we heard from Chair Powell, uh, we also heard that from Secretary Yellen over the weekend, was that inflation supply chain issues are likely to last well into uh, 2022. So I think they're trying to tell us, look, this is going to be with us for a while, but and and uh, the Fed is going to taper very soon. So uh, so we ex uh, expect an announcement next week. 
but that the hikes are still you know further out and the market is absolutely calling uh, the fed's bluff i would say global interest rates are calling the central bank bluff and saying that they will be forced into start hiking much sooner i actually think that um, you know inflation will at some point decelerate next year at some point <clears throat> supply chain issues will go away we think there's a lot of labor market slack so we're actually uh, uh, pushing back against this move uh, in front end rates decelerate though to what and this is really the issue as you look at 10 year break evens bumping up against the highest since 2005 this idea that people yes are seeing a lower inflation rate than we are seeing now but still uh, north of two and a half percent at what point does the fed start to pay attention to that and actually treat that as the right way to view longer term inflation Sure. So I think, you know, we've been used to the last 20 years of much lower inflation. Maybe the next decade is going to be a 2% type inflation. You know, maybe we're going to be in a 2 to 3% range. I think what the Fed's going to watch for is these long-term inflation expectations, five-year, five-year break-evens. Are they looking unanchored? I think that's an, a, an extremely important aspect. And the other one's going to be wage inflation. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the big question is, has the labor market structurally changed? Has this exactly. great resignation, is that going to remain or are people going to come back? We feel very strongly that people who've left the labor force are going to, a, a lot of them are going to come back. I mean, people who've retired, maybe not, but others are going to come back. At some point, those savings are going to run out. So if wages, um, you know, start to stabilize, start to head lower, at least uh, um, the rate of wage inflation, I think that will give the Fed confidence that there is labor market slack. And, you know, raising interest rates to try and solve a supply chain issue is, is, is not the solution. Raising uh, rates to solve the labor market being tight, I think absolutely, um, uh, you know, that will be the response. Right. I think it's going to actually come down to the labor market slack or, or their perception. Exactly. Pri, that's right where I wanted to go. Before you came on air, I was looking at the ECI, the blended folks wage and benefits dynamic, and it really hasn't broken out. When you fold in your interest rate work with TD Securities, economist work, do you suggest a breakout to true nominal and even positive real wage inflation? Or can you not say that? Yeah, actually, I'm glad you bring up ECI. We prefer the ECI over the average hourly earnings because average hourly earnings is picking up, uh, uh, you know, uh, when people move jobs, they should uh, uh, earn a higher rate. ECI is actually looking at if I've had the same job over the last year, has my wage have my wages gone up? So I think this whole idea of how the labor market is structurally changing, I think ECI does a much better job. We think that people are going to return. It just <clears> could <throat> take a while. People have moved. There are frictions in the labor market. At some point when people come back, that ECI is, is, is a, I would say, a, a, a much more comprehensive measure. We don't see wage inflation picking up uh, at all for, for a while, which which is why we have the first Fed rate hike only late 2023. So I think front end of, of the rate market globally, but uh, but particularly in the U.S., I think it's very attractive. I think people should move, not take duration risk. The Fed's about to taper, but move out from buying tens into fives, threes. I think the Fed is a long way here um, from hiking interest Pray, rates. You think we've priced too much into the belly of the curve, right? I, th I think so, yes. I think we've priced a lot in the front end. That end point of the hiking cycle is not moving higher. I think the market's really confused that the Fed might have to start hiking, but can the economy withstand much higher interest rates? Which is why what is um, surprising to me is the end point of the hiking cycle is only 1.6, 1 1.5. I mean, would the Fed want to start raising rates if all they can do is rise, you know, raise it to 1.5? That's what looks odd. So I think the belly may have a little bit more room to rise. That very front end, which is much more about the start of the hiking cycle, I think that is the most mispriced. Priya, thank you. Priya Misra of TD Securities Thanks. joining us on the rates market, pushing back against the rate height talk. Here's another story for you, Tom. Eric Shaska helping to deliver this one. Hertz said to buy 100,000 Teslas in car rental market shakeup. That stock up in a pre-market by 3.8%, Tom. That is a big purchase, $4.2 billion worth <clears throat> of Teslas. And, and a huge symbol of every day becoming more of a car company. I've got to be honest, John, to me, I, it doesn't matter. I can't get in a Tesla. They're worse than a Camry for headroom. That's the Tom King so take on that, things. My take is I go to Hertz and go, I'm either walking or give me something I can get in. Yeah, Tom, I'm not sure that's going to help Tesla this morning.
Not that they need it. You don't think the right now. stock's going to dip it. right I now think, because they're, they're doing okay, Tom. <laughs> up by 3.7 percent, Lisa, in a pre-market. One of the biggest aspects of this story is that they also Hertz will also build out the electric charging station network, independent of yeah. uh, Tesla. The idea: How can people adapt to an electric vehicle world when they don't have the charging stations to keep themselves going? This sort of providing some of the uh, of the of the answer to that, perhaps. It also raises questions to me, John. And this is something you and I talk about a lot, this idea of what is the new model of renting cars? Is it just having a car that is autonomously, autonomously driven show up, you can go somewhere, you drop it off, and it goes to the next person? How much does this disrupt an industry and remove the need for drivers, which goes directly to what Priya Miser was talking about with the labor market? We want to subscribe to something I will call, Tom, Mercedes Premium, where you have an app, I pay a monthly subscription. Mercedes. I go on there, Mercedes, <laughs> someone else. Yeah. Or Mercedes. Yeah. I select a car, Tom, the model that I like, and it just arrives for me tomorrow morning and it drives me to work. That's the perfect setup yeah. for me, TK. $500 a month. Let's just call it $500 a month you know, and 10,000 miles worth of travel through the year. You know, John, I mean, I, I'm trying to look on the New York State electric vehicle charging stations map. Yeah. And I, I've never looked at the map below 59th Street, and I'm doing that now. And, you know, there's a fair number of charging stations down where the fancy people like you live. There's exactly two charging stations in Soho, south of Houston Street. <laughs> I, where's that? Houston Street. Yeah, they named know. it after the Astros. Is that right? Why would yeah. you tell people where I live? No, I'm not. <laughs> I, you know, you live, John, John lives, folks, like 42 blocks in a concentric circle. Is that right? There's hardly Thanks, any John. charging stations down there. Thank you, TK. Tom Keen. <laughs> Lisa Bramitz and Jonathan Farrow. I How give about up those with markets? you. And honestly, more than those markets. Up a tenth on the S&P. All-time highs on the S&P 500 in through Fulton much of last Street. week. There's a charging station near Goldman Sachs. Is that right? Yeah. Do I live next door to there too? No, you don't live next Why don't you just give them a door number, Tom? Tell oh, them no, the apartment. Oh, no, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's good. You respect my privacy. That means a lot. This is Bloomberg. With the First Word News, I'm Laura Wright. China is warning that new COVID-19 infections will increase in the coming days after the latest outbreak, which is fueled by the Delta variant, expanded to 11 provinces. It locked down hundreds of thousands of people in the north, asking them to stay home. Officials are warning of civil and criminal penalties for anyone disobeying the order. UK Chancellor Rishi Sunak is set to announce almost £6 billion for the National Health Service at this week's government budget. The boost as the UK attempts to clear backlogs caused by the pandemic is one of a few major giveaways likely in Wednesday's financial statement. Sunak's task is complicated by a stuttering economic recovery, faster inflation and a surge in virus cases. Turkey's lira fell to a record today amid the country's ongoing diplomatic spat. Already under pressure for Following a larger than expected rate cut last week, the currency slid again after President Erdogan said the ambassadors of 10 nations, including the US, Germany and France, were no longer welcome. The countries are demanding the release of a prominent businessman and philanthropist. PayPal says it is not pursuing an acquisition of Pinterest, ending days of speculation over a potential $45 billion deal. Last week, Bloomberg News reported PayPal had approached Pinterest about a potential deal. An acquisition of Pinterest, a visual search and scrapbooking platform, would have boosted PayPal's ambitions to become the next global super app. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Laura Wright. This is Bloomberg. We are going through a period of inflation that's higher than Americans have seen in a long time, but we haven't lost control. I expect these bottlenecks to um, subside. Americans will return to the labor force as conditions improve.
The Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen, there speaking on CNN. From New York City this morning, Tom Keane, Lisa Bravitz and Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market up six on the S&P. We advance by a little bit, a little more than a tenth of one percent. In the bond market, yields are higher by two or three basis points to 166. Tom Keane, this administration having a conversation it doesn't want to have, and that's a win for the Republicans. Every time they go on air right mm. now in the United States, on broadcast television, on the radio, in print. It's a conversation about one thing, Tom. It's inflation. And that's exactly the conversation the Republican Party want them to be having. Absolutely. And you see it linked right into what we talked about before, John, as a gallon of gas. Let's just go through it really quickly here. Any number of ways to measure this, but the key way to measure it is it's different in each city. In the Houston, the land of the Houston Astros, they play the Boston Braves coming up. But in Houston, it's $2 something a gallon. In San Francisco, it's $4 something a gallon. John, those are real numbers. Neil Dutter of Renmac picking up on the tone, the shift in the tone, yeah. said this about Chairman Powell on Friday. Powell sounded less anxious about employment and more anxious about inflation. He is not really leaning against the market pricing, which is revealing in and of itself. The take there, Tom, of Neil Dutter of Renaissance Macro. Well, it's about the market pricing here, and the market pricing can be in politics as well. Let's get to it, because we're going to get to Turkey here in a moment. Amory Horton joins us, our Bloomberg Washington correspondent. Uh, Amory, Greg Vallier with a scathing essay this morning on, I believe it was mm -hmm. seven reasons why the billionaire tax will go down in flames like every other tax as well. How likely is it? we will see a billionaire or a millionaire tax. Yeah, Greg Vallier really scathing and also bringing up some points that, one, potentially this is going to face constitutional challenges. And also, how do you have a value for things like someone who has a coin collection or Monet? And also, what happens if those values go down? Do you get uh, taxes back? We just don't know yet the plans of this. They are still discussing it. But what we do know is that Senator Kirsten Cinema is not on board with the original proposal to fund this entire social spending plan, which was the corporate rate and income rate, increasing those rates on taxes. So they're looking in this billionaires, potentially, or uh, mega millionaires tax, about 700 people this would be focused on. But there's still so many questions. So it does feel like there's a little bit of progress in terms of the talk. But it's going to be wild to, a while to see pen to paper. This is a tax that has not been vetted and something that has not been done anywhere else in the world. So to get it done in a matter of days, I'm going to be cynical, just seems impossible. That number, though, Anne-Marie, Tom, let's not let that slide. The number 700. This is really, really important. Tom, when you hear people on the left, people in the Democrat Party, talk about billionaires, it's as if there are cities of them. There are 700 billionaires <laughs> in the United States of America. A lot of people are criticizing this effort now to tax unrealized capital gains. And Tom, I think it's important to recognize one thing. The goal was to get billionaires, 700 of them, in the United States of America to pay more in taxes. This is the first time that we've had a big effort this year to reconcile the objective with policy. Because Tom, I keep hearing, let's go after the billionaires. Then simultaneously, I hear, let's tax people earning more than 400K. Now, Tom, if you want to go after the so-called billionaires, doing it through income taxes doesn't get it done. And that's no. what's intriguing to me, Tom, about this moment. There are only 700 billionaires in the United States of America, yeah. according to, say, Forbes. If you want to go after well, them, these are the difficult conversations we've got to have. And I thought of yeah. Samuel Bowles in a definitive book that we had a decade ago, I'll say, out of Princeton, Samuel Bowles on microeconomics, behavior in taxes. Anne-Marie, what's the behavior here how desperate is the Democratic leadership? And, and incredibly desperate to get this bill passed. Quickly, a note from what Jonathan is saying is ProPublica did an entire report on this, looking at a vast amount of IRS data over the summer. And you have the likes of Jeff Bezos, 2007, 2011, no income tax rates. And that is what the likes of Senator Warren and Senator Ron Wyden, the chair of the Senate Finance Committee, who's going to be drafting this proposal, is trying to get out. This, is, this isn't about the entire country obviously paying its fair share. It's really about those that are escaping those income tax rates. And if they are, how do you go after that unrealized capital gains? When it comes to the Democrats trying to push this through, you saw them working over the entire weekend. The notice we have this morning, and CNN is reporting, that Senator Joe Manchin has been able to come up and he's lifted his line in the sand for that top line figure from 1.5 to 1.75. Uh, so potentially a $250 billion lunch the president was able to 
to get over the weekend. But there's still a number of issues at play here. But it's a critical week because, of course, the president wants something before he goes to Europe. And then when he comes back, he faces two important governor races in Virginia and New Jersey as well for the Democrat Party. And Marie, how much is this turning a talking point into policy versus just getting enough of an agreement to get the physical infrastructure plan to a vote? It's a bit of both. A framework definitely they want to get done before October 31st. This is that soft, self-imposed deadline. It's also when the highway um, funding runs out, so they want to be able to have those billions of dollars instead of just doing a separate stopgap funding measure to extend that funding to actually just pass the bipartisan infrastructure. Also, they want this win. They want to be able to go campaign in Virginia, campaign in New Jersey, and help those Democrats and say, look, we are moving forward. Bipartisan infrastructure what they call the BIF here in Washington, D.C., has wide bipartisan support, but is a framework, it's a good question, enough to get through? Potentially it could be, but there's still, as I say, tons of questions. Okay, if you get Mansion and you get Cinema on board with this new tax proposal, what happens when it comes to Medicare as well? The president at the CNN town hall in Baltimore said that that doesn't look like it's going to be this expansion of vision, dental, and hearing that many of the progressives wanted. What happens to the likes of Senator Bernie Sanders. Every single individual, the basic needs of all these senators need to be met in order to get some sort of framework agreed upon. Amory, thank you. As always, Amory Horton down in DC. Tom, this topic is really, really <laughs> difficult. It's complex well, and it's more complex than the conversation in Washington would suggest. It's not just about taxing the rich. Who are the rich? It's not about right. paying your fair share. What is fair? Most people, Tom, who are salaried and earn over 400K are probably paying close to 50% tax all in, income, state, local. What's fair, Tom? 50%? And if we're talking about the billionaires, the so-called billionaires, then we need to talk about how many there are in this country, Tom. There are about 700 billionaires in the United States of yeah. America. So, OK, if we're going to do something about the 700, what are the policies that will extract more tax from those 700 people? And, Tom, it's not a push up in the higher rate of income tax, is it? It's something else. Well, it doesn't. The, the, the bottom line, as Villiers mentions, it doesn't raise enough. But, John, let's take it to the ultimate billionaire. The Queen Mother died, and Queen Elizabeth escaped all sorts of tax, I'm sure through proper British law and fancy lawyers and fancy trust. I, I mean, it's an ageless thing for people with a pot of money. And, Tom, as you point out, there is a big difference between evasion and avoidance. One is illegal and one is perfectly legal. And yeah. if you want them to pay more in taxes, then by all means change the rules. But just pushing up the income tax thresholds, Tom, that's, just, that's not what gets it done. What, what I see here is desperation and a lot of unintended You're not consequences the only one. down the road. You're not the only one. Tom Keane, Lisa Bramitz and Jonathan Farrow from New York City this morning. Good morning to you all on Radio on TV, kicking off a new trading week. This is Bloomberg. Just pulling back from all-time highs at a close on Friday, breaking that seven-day winning streak on the S&P 500. This morning, back at it, a lift up five on the S&P, advancing a little more than a tenth of 1%. On the Nasdaq, advancing about 35, call it 36. We're high there by a quarter of 1%. The Russell, the small caps, unchanged, Tom, looking ahead to a week full of tech earnings. Setting the stage in the bond market for next week. Next week, what a week we've got coming up for you. Chairman Powell and a Fed decision on the Wednesday, then it's payrolls on the Friday. Going into this 165.90 on a 10-year, we pull back from 170 in Friday's session. Yields higher again, though, by three basis points on 10s, on 30s, up by 3 to 2.1%. It's that two-year segment of the curve I want to talk about, 46 basis points right now. And here's the chart over the last year. If you took the chart of the two year yield over the last five years, we've barely taken a bite out of things. And some over the last two years, say, at the moment, this is what it looks like at the moment. We've got a lift, but we're nowhere near where we were going into the pandemic <clears throat> yeah, because we had nice to cut chart. rates nice so aggressively. Straight What's interesting about this pickup in the two year, Tom, is the degree of pushback we got from Chairman Powell on Friday. Not much. In the words of Neil Dutter of Renmac, not much at all. The focus seems to be a little bit more anxiousness on inflation and less on employment. And, yeah. Tom, if that's the word, the story coming from the likes of Neil Dutter, you wonder what that means for the news conference next week, Tom. Just how aggressively will they push back I against rate pricing? I've said this all morning, John. They're going to wait for more data. And to get to the news conference, John, they've got to see that data. They will get some more data, Tom, yes. the Friday after 
the decision. Payroll's just around the corner. That's a little difficult. We will see. And that's a very fraud. Those of you on radio, the chart that John had was really extraordinary to show what the normal was in the two-year yield that we remember. Amy Wu Silverman is equity derivative strategist at RBC Capital Markets. All you need to know is her research notes are really sophisticated and have loads of Greek letters. She looks at the cross moments, skew, kurtosis, and the rest of it and distills it down to shut up and hold or shut up and buy or maybe go to cash. She joins uh, this morning. Amy Wu on rated change and on Delta, not the convexity, not the second derivative. You are all first derivative this earnings week. Why? Oh, look, you know, it, this is really the week the market reports, right? So, you, you know, you basically have the big mega cap tech fang names and, and those five names really make up 20% of the S&P. So the folks who are using options right now, uh, Tom, uh, particularly for this Friday's weekly expiration, what are they <clears> playing? They're either trying to hedge, you know, this movement in tech, right. which could result <clears> in a movement in the market. Um, or they're doing it individually, but these mega cap names are really driving the market uh, overall because of their size. I want to give our audiences on radio and television, Amy, well, the idea here of what is in your research notes. Let's take Apple. We could take any other name, folks. And I want to talk about the delta, the rate of change, and also what you see in the cross moments. Take Apple now, and if somebody wants to go long or somebody wants to hedge their long how rich is the derivatives market of Apple? And folks, just to be clear, Delta is not an airline. <laughs> well, it is an airline, but it, in the context of options, it's also the sensitivity of option price uh, to changes in the stock price. And obviously, that's what we're looking for, especially when there's an event, Tom. Surprisingly, you know, Apple options are not that expensive. We compare it to all its comps that are reporting. We compare it to the market. We compare it to its own realized volatility over time. And heading into this earnings, Apple options are fairly inexpensive. And the other thing is the amount of demand for hedges is actually declining. Uh, which we think is interesting, you know, given that it was kind of at the center of the storm around the privacy issues that obviously bled into Snap and into other uh, tech names that we saw last week. So Amy, taking a step back, does that mean that people are pretty optimistic <clears throat> heading into these tech earnings, that basically uh, they think that a lot of the bad news and the potential discrepancies uh, that have stemming from some of the supply chain disruptions have all been priced in? Yeah, you know, when we look to the options market, that was one of my takeaways. Uh, in particular, after last week, I'll give you one example. Snap obviously down, you know, 26% on earnings. But if you actually look to the derivatives market, it has now gone into skew inversion. Just to translate that, that means the demand for calls is now outweighing the demand for puts. That's a fairly abnormal uh, event that doesn't always happen in options. And it's signaling uh, kind of an extreme level of bullishness. We're also seeing that in Facebook as well. We're seeing that in Apple. So you know, look, people can be wrong in the options market just as they are in the stock market, but the sentiment is certainly shifting more bullish ahead of this week. Amy, one of the wonderful things that you do is you track the correlations and try to understand what the triggers are. And here we are heading into tech earnings at a time when there's increasing <clears throat> bearishness around bonds, right, about around duration. And typically tech has been viewed as the most duration heavy area. How do you view the correlation with people's view on the rates market with tech sentiment at a time when they've been posting blockbuster earnings? Yeah, it's a great question. And obviously, kind of the, also the 10,000 foot view related to that is that tech is kind of at the center of this growth versus value trade, just as it is uh, compared to bonds as well. I'll say one thing right now, you know, correlations will tend to break down a little simply because we're going into earnings, which tends to be an extremely idiosyncratic event. Uh, so if there was any time for that dispersion to appear in the market, it would be now. But I do think that as we head back into year end, that becomes something that people watch very closely, just where tech is compared to uh, the bond-related ETFs like a TLT, a HYG, and LQD. Can you do a derivative analysis of a moonshot? Up we went above 800, down we went on Tesla, and now up through 951 uh, this morning on the Schatzker article. I should notice Mr. Jonas at Morgan Stanley uh, raising his price target as well. Can you, Amy Wu Silverman, 
do a Greek letter analysis of something as original as Tesla? I love Tesla for, from an options perspective. And, and the reason is it's just become its own special animal. You know, yeah. we have we have 500 to 1,000 stocks that we watch all the time, Tom. And occasionally we just have to put Tesla in its own special bucket. Uh, one thing I'll tell you on Tesla right now, <clears throat> it's equity skew, uh, one of your favorite words, right. that demand for put protection had been really, really high. It dropped a little bit after earnings. But what I think is interesting is it's still pretty high and earnings are over, right? So so what what is the market kind of concerned about on Tesla? Just just before well, I started this call with you, you know, we, we saw the Hertz announcement on Tesla. So maybe that changes today. Yeah, thank you to Eric Schatzker for that reporting. And, and Amy, well, what's so important here, and folks, I don't want to get too in the weeds here, but if you have a continued hedge value to Tesla, at some point up, they have to cover. Is there a convexity opportunity in Tesla where we see an acceleration higher as busted trades are covered? Yep. So, so you know, you're you're referring to to kind of what people refer to as the gamma hammer or the gamma squeeze, where you know a lot of the times when yeah. you see that um, inversion in skew, right? That call demand again outweighing that put demand, it forces dealers. Who are doing delta hedges on the other side because dealers are trying to not take directional bets, right? They're trying to not take bets on delta. They're simply trying to facilitate uh, people on both sides. If there's extreme call buying, you can essentially see more stock up situations because of that that Greek letter uh, gamma, that gamma squeeze that's happening in Tesla. Before we let you go, Amy, I'd love to get a gauge of just how active traders have been going into the earnings season. The idea that we've gotten so many of the gains that the year is almost over, especially as people recalibrate their expectations for Fed policy. How much is activity increasing as there's this idea that this is the last hurrah this week of earnings before people basically pack up their bags and go on vacation? Yeah, we've seen a lot of institutional activity. We've seen a lot of hedging in QQQs ahead of this week. I think a lot of that is related to just simply how large a market cap is reporting in this week alone. Obviously, we see the traditional year-end hedging. But, you know, we have seen a drop-off, Lisa, in retail demand. So, you know, retail, which was busy trading call options to kind of insane degrees last year during the pandemic, that's dropped off a lot. You know, I think they're busy trading uh, cryptocurrencies now, but, you know, that activity has lessened uh, much more than uh, it was at this point last year. Amy, thank you. As always, Amy Wu Silverman there, the wonderful Amy Wu Silverman of RBC Capital Markets on a big week for big tech. You know what the quiet tech <laughs> name is right now, Tom? Microsoft up by 39% here yeah. today yeah, and barely yeah, gets yeah. a look in anymore. What a run. Yeah, well, it's been a run, and some do it one year, and then they pause, and they do it another year. But, John, I think what's so important is the people we talk to looking out three, four, five years, even Doug Cass, who's trading partitions out to an enthusiasm out <coughs> three or <coughs> excuse me, five years as well. John, I can't say enough about bringing Amy Wu Silverman on Truly Talking Greek and the value that is for Global Wall Street. Some of the stuff she was talking about there's nicely inside baseball. Totally agree, Tom. And she mentioned how much she liked Tesla. So let's talk about that a little bit more. Sure. Up 4% in the pre-market. Great story from our colleague, Eric Shatsky. The lead paragraph reading as follows. Hertz, barely four months out of bankruptcy, placed an order for 100,000 Teslas in the first <clears> step of an ambitious plan to electrify its rental car fleet. This according to people with knowledge of the matter. Lisa, that's a $4.2 billion price tag, according to the story. It's the biggest single purchase of electric vehicles ever. And the idea that Hertz barely had a bankruptcy. I like how you phrase that, John. The idea that they get some money and what do they do? They make a bold investment. And frankly, investors celebrate that. That to me is interesting. The idea that people well, are looking for bold at a time when money is free. John, how does General Motors or Porsche or the others, how do they respond? Well, clearly, Tom, they're working on it right now. We talked about the take on, didn't we? That Porsche offering, Tom. Yeah. outselling the 911. So it's happening. It's happening. We've talked about the multiple on, say, GM, Ford. We've been talking about mm -hmm. that together over the last week. Those two names have had a great run this week, so much so that we're now discussing the likes of Dan Ives of Wedbush covering these names, Tom. Not just Tesla, but the likes of Ford, <laughs> the likes of GM.
Yeah, well, they are. And, you know, I'm looking here right now. I've got a closing market cap on Tesla of under a trillion dollars. John, we may be over a trillion dollars by the end of the day. We could be there, Tom. We could. 9.45.55 in a pre-market. Coming up on Facebook a little bit later, Michael Nathanson, the founding partner and senior Good research thing, yeah. analyst at Moffitt Nathanson. We're up a tenth of 1% on the S&P. From New York, this is Bloomberg. With the first word news, I'm Laura Wright. West Virginia Democratic Senator Joe Manchin appears to be on board with White House proposals for new taxes on billionaires and certain corporations to help pay for President Biden's scaled back social services and climate change package. CNN is reporting Manchin is OK with a $1.75 trillion package that follows a meeting on Sunday between President Biden, Manchin and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer at the president's home in Delaware. U.S. labor shortages will persist into 2022 and contribute to a permanent increase in business costs. That's according to the latest survey by the National Association for Business Economics. Some 36% of respondents currently experiencing worker shortages said they expect them to end at some point next year. None see it happening before the end of 2021. 14% see shortages abating in 2023 or later. A big move for car rental company Hertz, which is barely four months out of bankruptcy. Bloomberg has learned Hertz has placed an order for 100,000 Teslas. It's reportedly the first step of an ambitious plan to electrify its rental car fleet. Sources tell Bloomberg it's the single largest purchase ever for electric vehicles and amounts to about $4.2 billion of revenue for Tesla. HSBC is outlining a bullish outlook for the months ahead, fueled by likely increases in interest rates. The London-based lender also said it will kick off a higher-than-expected share buyback program. Adjusted pre-tax profit rose to about $6 billion in the third quarter, beating estimates. Revenue climbed slightly in the third quarter for the first time in almost two years. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120. 20 countries. I'm Laura Wright. This is Bloomberg. There's this dance between what the what officials at the central bank want to see happen and what the market wants to see happen. And sometimes they are perfectly in a line like they were earlier this year about transitory inflation. And sometimes they're not. And that might be what we're seeing right now. We've seen this movie before, a little bit of tension between what the market is pricing and the guidance from the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Jay Powell. Jim Bianco there of Bianco Research. Tom Keane, Lisa Bramitz and Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market up five on the S&P. Futures advancing about a tenth of 1%. Into the bond market, yields high. Yields lower on Friday, pulling back from 170. We add a little bit of weight to the 10-year yield, 165.19. Yields up two basis points. In line with that move, Tom Crude. Heading north again, up by 1.24 percent. WTI 84.80, <clears throat> and Brent crude. Tom, where's that now? Up one percent, 86.43. That's closer to 90 than 80. There we go. We add another 90 All cents to, to Brent crude. Tom. Very good. Right now, we're going to do this. We're going to talk to David Wilson quickly about the former president and then the important reporting of Eric Schatzker on Tesla uh, and the rest. David Wilson, what do you have this morning? I have Donald Trump's meme world, Tom, and I say that because, you know, you had this deal last week uh, from a uh, special purpose acquisition company, SPAC, Digital World Acquisition, to take over this, uh, shall we say, fledgling media business. And you really saw the shares take off on Thursday and Friday. But it wasn't just Digital World. I mean, you have this other company called Funware that had actually worked uh, for Trump's re-election campaign in 2020, a software maker, and its shares were up even more. And then you look at other SPACs tied into uh, the CEO of Digital World, and you see they were rising as well. Uh, one of them, Benasir Capital, is actually higher again today. And then uh, he's, he's the CEO of that company as well as Digital World. And then there's Yunhong International, which he also runs, and Makia Capital, where he's the director. Put it all together, and it's not just one meme stock. It's five coming out of this single deal. 
Very good. David Wilson, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it uh, this morning. Uh, it has been important reporting on too many levels. What we're going to do is not review the reporting of Eric Schatzker on Tesla, on Hertz, and the rest, but we're going to drive forward the story with Mr. Schatzker's knowledge here of electric vehicles. First, Eric, congratulations on this uh, reporting. And what I want to know, I calculate $1,000 a share on Tesla to a trillion dollar company. What kind of trillion dollar company will Tesla be? Well, to the degree, Tom, that more auto, uh, more rental car companies, because it's not just gonna be Hertz, eventually Enterprise, eventually Avis, eventually Sixth, eventually, maybe not Europe Car, because they're owned by Volkswagen, but they're all gonna move toward EVs. So if you believe the EV revolution and you believe that Hertz by ordering 100,000 Teslas is started. changing the game yeah, for yeah. the rental car industry, then I'm not going to put a valuation on Tesla, but you know there's more demand behind this. Let's put it that way. Eric, how instrumental is it for other companies to build out the electric network? I mean, that was part of this announcement. The idea or part of your reporting was that Hertz would independently invest in those charging stations that are key to having Tesla be more mainstream. Sure. Hertz has to build its own network of chargers because... You can't take a rental car and have to drive it to a Tesla supercharger in order to have it ready for the next customer. The question, the sort of the implicit question embedded in what you asked is whether these chargers that Hertz is building is, are going to become part of a nationwide, at least here in the United States, and maybe even broader continental in North America, something similar happening in Europe, network available to other users, let's say. Maybe they're not Hertz customers. Maybe they're not even necessarily Tesla owners. But there are more and more companies coming out with EVs. We know that Ford has an ambitious plan for its pickup truck, the F-150. Clearly, General Motors, an early player in EVs, nowhere near as big as Tesla, has ambitious plans. Volkswagen, Porsche, they're all moving in the same direction. And eventually, in theory, people are going to have to have access to chargers the same way they have access to multiple brands of gasoline. So Hertz just emerged from bankruptcy. Where do they get the money for this? Oh, well, Hertz is doing awfully well, actually. They've got a billion eight in cash on the balance sheet. The rental car industry has turned around dramatically since May of 2020 when Hertz filed for bankruptcy. Back then, as you'll recall, there was no demand. It evaporated. Business travel was gone. Leisure travel was gone. Hertz had a bad balance sheet. A legacy of its leveraged buyout was the first to go. Avis didn't file for bankruptcy. Enterprise didn't file for bankruptcy. But bankruptcy, as we know, can be a beautifully cleansing process. So now Hertz is shorn of so much of the debt that it was carrying. It's a much more nimble right. company. It has new ownership in Knighthead and Sertaris. It has Mark Fields, the former CEO of Ford, as its interim CEO. This is an illustration Right. of what a newly empowered company can do in an old commoditized industry. Eric, you and I know Vivi Chara can't get in a Tesla. I'm here to inform you Frank Mahovlich can't get in a Tesla <laughs> either at 6'1 or a tall 6'2. Oh, he could get into a Model X. He get it, but that's the point. What's the EV car that's actually going to be that first American car, not a car of the elite? It's the Model 3. That's why Hertz is ordering 100,000 Tesla Model 3s. This is the EV equivalent of, let's call it the Chevy Impala. It's a much nicer car to drive than the Chevy Impala. So what's Mari, Mari Barr doing this morning? Cut to the chase here. What's she doing? She's figuring out what is GM's strategy for that middle of the market. Right now, GM is playing with a Chevy Bolt at the bottom of the market, bottom and it's market. designing some really exciting stuff at the top end of the market. Where's the middle in the market Cadillac. car? They don't have one. That's why the only right. place that Hertz can go for 100,000 EVs right. is Tesla. They're the only okay. company with the capacity and the only company with the car. John Schatzker's here. I got to ask one more question. Fabulous news out of Canada this weekend that they're saying COVID's done. What did Canada do different than the United States? We opened up faster here. I was just there, Tom. Toronto feels like it's three months behind the United States, three months behind New York City. Really? Yeah, but... I'm not so sure. So we can talk about a COVID score. Canada is clearly doing better. Ontario right. has only 325 cases a week okay. of COVID. But look at the economy. The economy is not... Life in Canada has not returned nearly okay. as much back to normal as it has here. And that, of course... Is what we're we trying gotta, to is the balance we're trying to weigh. John, we got to leave it here for two reasons. One, um, we're running out of time, and two, do you know Shasker had Kawas tickets at the Garden? One is important, Tom. Two less so. 
Eric, thank you. Great story, sir. Yeah, killer. Fantastic reporting. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you, the stock John. is up by a little more than 4%. So off the back of Eric's story, Tom, we stand down a $1 trillion market cap. And we discussed <clears> this on Friday, didn't we? We have the real prospect of a $1 trillion market yeah, cap in the equity we... and junk rated in the credit. Yeah, and I'm Square gonna... that one for well, me. Yeah, well, you're right. You've brought that up a couple times when you, when you look at the debt structure and all. But, John, I think what's so important here in the industry is to say when you're wrong. I was wrong on Tesla. Shatsker was right. Winkler was right. Who else was right, John? Were you right, John? I don't I know. I was dead wrong. I was dead wrong. I'm sorry. 940. Shasker drives the stock to 950 with the story, and I fitted it. It's about $1,000, up by give or take a dollar. 4.3%. I'm Elon looking Musk, for an Tom, entry point at 1100. Keeps getting it done. Tom Keane, Lisa Brown, is <clears throat> Jonathan Farrow. You keep looking, Tom. John, you don't know TK, who Frank that entry Mahalo point. Is, do you? Yeah, I think he's an ice hockey player, isn't That's he? That's good. You nailed go. that. Cheers, nailed TK. That. I mean, that was just a guess. What's the John, big sport you need in Canada? A CCM five strike. That's what <laughs> okay. we need to get. You. Now I'm lost. Yields up two basis points on tens. One sixty-five, nineteen. Equity futures up a little more than a tenth of one percent. From New York, this is Bloomberg. There's this dance between what officials at the central bank want to see happen and what the market wants to see happen. Yes, inflation is a focus, but the market has priced a good amount of that. The market is essentially fading the Fed's inflation and maximum employment strategy. The consumer is able to bear a little bit of this price pressure, but I do think that there is a limit to this. If you can't meet demand, why would you advertise? Just cut your ad spending. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keith. Thrilled you're with us on radio, on TV, later in the hour on $86 a barrel oil. Uh, Ms. Wald will join us. That's going to be an important conversation, looking at equities, looking at earnings. And for Global Wall Street, in a few minutes, we consider the break-evens, the sophisticated part of judging inflation to the yield market and how it folds into everything else we do. Good morning, everyone. John Farrow, I just said there, sort of the landscape. What are you focused on? in that landscape. This week, tech earnings and the words from Jonathan Golliver, Credit Suisse there, Tom. If you can't meet demand, why advertise? Cut ad spend. What a phenomenal line there from Jonathan <laughs> Golub, reflected in the, the earnings of Snapchat and maybe reflected in the numbers we see later this week from the likes of Alphabet, the likes of Facebook as well. And then, Tom, it's on to Apple. Apple on October 28th. Are those supply chain difficulties really holding back their ability to meet that iPhone demand? No, we're seeing it. You're seeing it all over the world uh, right now. We will fold that in again to the lack of. There's a lack of Fed speak now, right, John? Blackout Last week period, we had Tom. Six people in a, a day, and now we have nothing. This is the week where people are very grateful, happy that we get no Fed speak whatsoever for yeah. a whole week, Tom. Then it's on to Chairman Powell, November third <clears throat> decision news conference. Yeah, Lisa's got that that bumper sticker by her desk. Put a cork in it, Jerome. Uh, good morning, <laughs> Lisa. In Washington right now, it's really. Do you like that, Lisa? In Washington That's great. right now. Oh, it's extraordinary. I mean, I have no idea what they're going to do besides tax you and the rest of the billionaires. Well, there's the issue with respect to fiscal <laughs> stimulus, fiscal spending. There's also the question, though, of next week with Jerome Powell. How much have we calculated what tapering looks like? And how much do we understand oh, what bond purchases have done to a market <clears throat> that is uh, can't seem to go down too much? Tom, I do think that this will increasingly be the debate as Jay Powell tries to divorce the conversation from taper uh, to rate hiking. From what you've read, Lisa, are we going to get tax legislation? I can't figure it out. I can't understand how realistic they're trying to get policy versus a talking point they can all coalesce around. I mean, honestly, the idea of what is the threshold to finally vote on the infrastructure right. plan that everyone agrees upon. To me, I don't even understand that, Tom. Well, I don't understand Liverpool, man, you. John Farrow, the, the gentleman from Britain, talked about 700 souls, 700 lads are billionaires. I mean, John, the desperation in Washington is extraordinary. Is it desperation, though, Tom, or finally a realization that we need to have a difficult conversation about how to get more tax from billionaires and how many billionaires there actually, billionaires there actually are? Yeah. There's about 700 of them in America. Let's OK, let's have a conversation about how to get more tax. Yeah. Tom, we've finally got to that point where I think the facade of the argument starts to break down. Tax the rich, who are they? Make sure they pay their fair share, what is fair? 
We need to have a real conversation about that, it's Tom. Not I don't happening. Think we just haven't had that yeah. enough this year. We're taxing Monet's, as was uh, brought up by Greg Vallier. John, let's do the data check right now because our guest this morning is so important on inflation dynamics. Futures up seven. John, the VIX 15.84. I would actually look for that to be a bit lower. It's not. It yields up two basis points, 165.37. And crude, WTI approaching 85, 84, 86. 86 on Brent, Tom. $2.8647, up 1.1%. West Texas up 1.3%. And John, in the metals complex, I know it pulled back, but I'm sorry, it is come out of these elevators. Just a lift, a lift across the board. <clears throat> Let's get to our first guest yes, for this that. hour. Shahid Landhar joins us now, head of G10 Rate Strategy at BMP Paribas. Shahid, let's start right here. The amount of daylight at the moment between the guidance we're getting from the chairman of the Federal Reserve and what's been priced in this rates market. Sure. Thank you, uh, John. Um, look, I think that the Powell and the Fed are increasingly open to uh, the prospect of uh, perhaps a quicker hiking and tightening cycle um, than, than many thought possible even some months ago. Um, the lack of pushback uh, late last week from Powell, I think, underlines it. Um, and markets are now, as we know, pricing a little around two rate hikes next year. Um, and there should be four live meetings from July through to December. So perhaps we could price as much as four or, or even not necessarily just 25 basis point rate hikes. Shahid, do you think a meeting next summer could be a live one? The Bank of England has indicated that next week's meeting is a live one for the Bank of England. Do you think for the Federal Reserve, that first live meeting for rate hikes could come as soon as the summer next year? Absolutely. Um, I, and I think uh, every meeting after that next year can stay live. Um, and, and as I said, we've been more and more conditioned to expect a very slow hiking cycle. Um, but if inflation really is somewhat different this time, then perhaps the Fed needs to move quicker. Um, so like I said, we could get bigger increments um, or more um, frequency in a 25 basis point hike delivery. Shahid, before we get there, the Fed is going to start tapering their bond purchases. And I'm unclear on just how much agreement there is on the influence that the $120 billion of bond purchases have had on the $20 trillion U.S. bond market. What's your sense of the influence and thus the effect of withdrawing some of that? Sure. Um, so, so that's a, a big question. Um, when you look at 2020, the influence was was very, very clear um, because there was so much QE um, and net supply, despite the explosion of the deficit with pandemic related stimulus, um, net supply of treasuries was negative in 2020. So it had a massive impact in 2020. Since then, um, there has been an impact, but that impact has moderated as the flow of QE has normalized to about 80 billion a month on treasuries, um, 40 billion a month on MBS. And in the meantime, treasury supply has increased from about 230 to about 370 billion a month. So in other words, the Fed remains an important, the largest buyer of treasuries right now, um, but some degree of kind of almost coordinated stimulus and, and, and what seems like a coordinated exit from stimulus should make the, the path of net bond supply to the market, the paper that the market needs to buy, relatively smooth. I say that because as the Fed reduces its footprint buying treasuries, um, the treasury will reduce its deficit next year. Uh, we think that somewhere in the region of one and a half trillion, that's half the size of this year. So, Shahid, do you expect real yields to remain as negative as they are now in the United States, despite the tapering? We think they are a little too low still. Um, so our kind of post-COVID new, new normal would be nominal rates, you know, somewhere uh, at the, the recent new normal. So somewhere 10 years, around 2%. Um, we do think break-evens and inflation should be about 50 basis points higher. So that takes us to 230 or 240. Um, and the resulting real yield is about minus 50 or minus 60. So we certainly think that real yields are a little too too low right now. Um, spot at minus 5.5%, which is just spot, fed, spot real Fed funds because of high spot inflation. Um, and 10-year at minus 1%, likewise, right. is a bit too low. Um, but we do think they stay lower 
post-COVID than they were pre-COVID. Shai, very important question. We addressed this earlier. Let's do it with you right now. Is there a convexity in the market? Is there so much of a bet a certain direction that if that bet has to go, oops, I'm wrong, I have to cover, boom, up we go higher in yield? Um, There is a degree of that as we break through certain key levels with major exposures for certain types of accounts. But what we have seen, despite the level of realized vol, which has been pretty high in the past month or so as we've moved to higher rates, um, the forwards now remain pretty well pegged. Um, Five-year, five-year OIS in the region of about 180, um, two, ten-year in the region of about 170. Um, and even the, the 30 year rate, yes, it's jumping every day, but it's been somewhere between two or 220. So there is the possibility of convexity if we move out of the range and, and, and materially so. But even if we move a lot within the range, which is currently what's been happening since we got above 150 on 10s, really, um, then the convexity um, is, is limited. Shahid, what do we get first? The rate hike from the Fed? or a new manager at Manchester United? Ooh, um, I hope for uh, a rate hike first. Um, As a Liverpool um, fan, I wonder why. I wonder why. Mr. Solskjaer's doing a great job. You want them to suffer, don't you? Shahid, great to catch up, sir. Thank you. Shahid Ladha there, the BNP Paribas race strategist. Tom, just getting some confirmation from Hertz on the reporting that Eric Schatz has been doing on the 100,000 Tesla order that Hertz has delivered. They confirmed that order, that order for Tesla, 100,000 Teslas yeah. by the end of 22. And you'll like this little piece of it, won't you? They confirm a deal to hire Tom Brady to showcase Tesla ads. At Hertz. Yeah, and it's going to be interesting. As Schatzker said, it's a Model 3. It's got better headroom than the Model X and the rest of them as well. But Brady's 6'4", which, you know, I mean, John, I'm either 6'4". <laughs> so how, how tall are you, Tom? I'm 6'4", 6'5", depending on if my children need money. So this I think morning, you're I'm 6'4". I like, think you're taller here. than that. I love that his friend, point frame of reference is simply whether he can get in the car. That is the sole objective. Lisa, Brady's you have no, Lisa. Come on, Lisa, there's like six <laughs> cars. This is a serious issue. That's Front your seat, first seat. thought with Tom Brady? Really? <clears throat> I, I, Brady's going to flog the car. It's going to be great. It's gonna, it's, everything's gonna Are be you wonderful. more likely to rent one of those if Tom Brady advertises it? Oh, Tom? yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I think it's amazing how much money they're pumping into this. Are mm. they going to save money with this? Is this going to be just basically uh, an advertising I, pitch? I, really, I, from the Hertz perspective, I think this is fascinating as well. I rented a car in northern New England, and they sent me the redo of the bill like six weeks later. Who was driving it? Oh, well, Mrs. Keene was driving it. Oh, go. my. Oh, yeah, Tom. Was it expensive? Those, yeah. those rental oh, car my. companies, I just... Oh, my. I, I've been there a few times in Italy. Tom. I told her, I said, the last time we ran a Bentley. Was it a Bentley? <laughs> <laughs> Is We're that what it was? For you. Is that well, what it was, Tom? You know, it's like an SUV when we'll you send videos of that. Anyway, Michael Nathanson's going to okay. join us shortly from Moffitt Nathanson Wonderful. on the news out of Facebook, and I'm sure Tom wants to talk about anything mm. but. Futures are up six on the S&P. We're up about a tenth of 1%. From New York, this is Bloomberg. With the first word news, I'm Laura Wright. West Virginia Democratic Senator Joe Manchin appears to be on board with White House proposals for new taxes on billionaires and certain corporations to help pay for President Biden's scaled-back social services and climate change package. CNN is reporting Manchin is OK with a $1.75 trillion package that follows a meeting on Sunday between President Biden, Manchin and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer at the president's home in Delaware. China is warning that new COVID-19 infections will increase in the coming days after the latest outbreak, which is fueled by the Delta variant, expanded to 11 provinces. It locked down hundreds of thousands of people in the north, asking them to stay home. Officials are warning of civil and criminal penalties for anyone disobeying the order. Facebook has been concerned for months about its declining popularity among teens and young adults, but didn't let on to shareholders. That's among the accusations in a whistleblower's SEC complaint. Former Facebook employee Frances Horgan went public earlier this month with claims that Facebook has been prioritizing profits over user safety and security. Redacted versions of the documents were obtained by a consortium of news organizations, including Bloomberg News. 
global news 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Laura Wright. This is Bloomberg. This is the bottom, and it will just start getting a little bit better every quarter next year, but we're not going to see reasonable supply-demand balance until 2023. It just takes that long to build new capacity, to bring on new factories, to expand uh, capabilities in manufacturing, and to see a rebalancing of the supply chain across the industry. Things will get better. The message there from the Intel CEO, Pet Gaussens, uh, speaking to Bloomberg. From New York City this morning, good morning, Tom Keane, Lisa Bramis and Jonathan Ferro. I think it said Pet there and not Pat. Pat Gelsinger. He won't be coming back. Futures <laughs> up eight points on the S&P, advancing two-tenths of 1%. Into the bond market, yields higher by a basis point or two, 164.84. In the equity market, Tom, we have a lift this week. It's all about tech earnings from the big five through yeah. this week. Let's dovetail in a couple themes here right now on tech earnings. My essay of the year, Ian Bremmer in Foreign Affairs Magazine on the power and the strength of all these big tech companies. Just a fabulous look at where we're heading. And then John, fold that into the power and the strength of Cupertino to say, no, we make the rules for our users, particularly of iPhones. And then you go to the power and strength and shock of Snap. John, we witnessed that last it week. It very clearly hurt ad spend at Snap. To what degree, I don't know. That stock absolutely <clears throat> cratered. And then we started to think about what it would mean for Facebook too. Let's have that conversation now with Michael Nathanson, the founding partner and senior research analyst at Moffitt Nathanson. Michael, let's start there. I've talked a lot over the last week about the supply chain disruptions, the fact that people might not want to spend because they can't meet the additional demand that spending might deliver. Let's talk about the change at Apple, how much it surprised the C-suite at Snap and what it might mean later this week for some of the big tech players. Yeah, good morning, Jonathan. I think that was the story at Snap last week. You know, it was nice to blame supply chains, but I think they didn't, they didn't see the risk coming from those Apple changes on privacy protection. They were saying up until the last quarter, things are fine, we have this, do not worry, whereas Facebook was warning everyone. So supply chains definitely hurt autos and iPhone sales and technology sales. But I think that was a convenient excuse for what was probably misunderstanding the risks that Apple were, were bringing to their business. <clears throat> That's the power of it all, Michael. Is Netflix part of this group? I found it interesting that Dr. Bremer left it out of the essay. After Netflix, the subscribers, the mystery of streaming, which you cover better than anyone, is net, does Netflix have power? Netflix has power because they spend $18 billion a year in content, and their strategy is to basically just rifle shot every, you know, new content every day. And it's hard to compete with that. But their business, you know, we've argued in the past, doesn't have the same moat as Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, Google, Amazon, right? They're a different beast. You know, the FANG, the FANG acronym has been created, they're in it. But I don't think they're in the same business and the same type of moat protection that the other big five have. Um, so it's in the conversation, but it's such a different business model right. than the other companies. Well, we've got 18 questions very quickly here, Michael Nathanson, before yeah. the others jump in. What's your single best buy now out an institutional short term of three years? Which of these myriad of names is the one that gets you excited? This will surprise you. I'd say Facebook, which is, you know, printing results tonight. We're expecting a very tough quarter in terms of uh, forward guidance, the Apple effect, supply chain comments that Jonathan was referencing. But the stock's trading at a market multiple uh, on next year's numbers. And it just seems to us that they're so well positioned, even with all those headwinds, uh, you know, for years and years of double digit top line growth. So it's Facebook, which I know is counted to a current consensus. This I really think we need to dig into a little bit more. You've got a okay. price target of four hundred and twenty dollars on the Facebook shares, a really significant gain from where we are right now. And this comes despite some of the disclosures that we're seeing dribbled out from the whistleblower that's been testifying in Washington, D.C. What will get it to four hundred and twenty dollars a share amid all of this blowback amid the Apple privacy rules at a time when the shares are simply three hundred and twenty four dollars and sixty one cents? 
Okay, so Lisa, I've covered the stock for a while. There are times when you go through these um, intense spotlights on regulatory and business model pressures. I just think it's going to be quarters and quarters of good top line growth and it's meeting expectations. And I, I tell you, there's been times in the past where we've seen the spotlight from DC and regulators, never whistleblowers before, and the stock just powers through because they've got a great business model. Even with the IDFA, the IDFA changes, the Apple changes, if you want to reach people uh, for digital advertising, Facebook is one of the two or three places to go. And that's where the growth is coming from. So, you know, I know it's not, it's not comfortable to recommend Facebook here, given all we've learned about the company, but the business model is really, really well, well protected, given the long-term headwinds, uh, sorry, the tailwinds that the industry is saying. Michael, you're making a really important point here that last week everyone took a look at what Snap had to say and they said, oh my goodness, any company that relies on advertising, digital advertising is going to get sunk by supply chain disruptions. Are you saying that narrative is completely wrong, that those advertisers will keep advertising and that those companies that have adequately protected against the Apple privacy rules will be the ones that succeed? Yes, I'm not saying that the supply chain risks are not real. I'm not saying that the IDFA Apple changes are not real, but Facebook has spent, you know, 15 months warning us, investing in solutions. They have great first party data. They're a different business than Snap. Um, where the weakness was seen at Snap was on app downloads and mobile games. Facebook has 10 million advertisers, right? So there's no, no doubt in the near term, the pressures will be there from Apple changes and supply chain disruptions, however big they are. But Tom said in a three year view, I have a stock trading on a market multiple that's growing well in excess of the market. Seems to me that that's the place you want to invest in, right? So that's, but Lisa, your concerns and things you've raised are there. I think Facebook has thought about this for a long time now, and they've done things to try to mitigate the, the damage from, from Apple's changes. Michael, let's just finish on this just quickly. What would okay. it take, do you think, for advertisers on Facebook to go somewhere else and pull back and say, you know what, this just feels really toxic and that's not a platform I want my company to be a part of anymore. What would it take? Okay, okay so Jonathan, there are two types of advertisers. There are brand advertisers who are there to amplify their, their message and their brand and, and to be around content that they like. I see that as a big risk, you know, that Facebook advertisers or brand advertisers will leave, but that's a small portion of their ad base. The other, the, the core portion is performance advertisers who are putting out messages where they want a response, an app download, a site visit, a purchase checkout. Um, until the ROI, the return investment starts to really wane, they will keep spending. They're not there for the branding elements of Facebook. They're there to, to push a commerce activity. Right. So Jonathan, in, until that weakens, really weakens, they're gonna spend, right? It's it's supply and demand. The problem is there, there are not a lot of places to go outside of Facebook to reach that many and it's more than Facebook, it's Instagram as well, right? So there's a broad, broad patch of consumers out there who have historically clicked to buy, clicked to download, clicked to rent something, thanks to Facebook, right? So until that really weakens, they have them. That final point is so important. Michael, it's great to catch up. As always, sir, thank you. Michael Nathanson there of Moffitt Nathanson, Tom Keen, our swear crude, WTI with an 85 handle. Well, yeah, again, catching up. And you look at Brent Crude, 86.48, hasn't moved. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry, West Texas lifts. We've got a rally in this commodity market. More on that still to come from New York City on radio, on TV. This is Bloomberg. Live on TV and radio for our audience worldwide from New York City. This is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bravitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market shaping up as follows. Up seven on the S&P. We advanced by a little more than a tenth of 1%. Into the bond market, yields are higher by three basis points to 166.43. And there's the move. There's the number on crude, 85 on WTI, the first time we've been able to say that one, TK, since 2014, at 1.5% on the day. Now, that's the market moves, and it's a tertiary piece of economic data, John, but Chicago Fed National Activity Index has a negative statistic. A slip, Tom, for the month of September. And the revision is well on to the edge of it. Yep. 
Not a pretty read, Tom. Not That's for sure. Read. Dallas Fed manufacturing activity <clears throat> coming out at 10.30. Yeah. If you want another regional read, Tom, it comes a little bit later this morning. Do we have the perfect guest to talk about this? I think we do, John. Sarah House joining us now, Tom. Sarah House with us with Wells Fargo, and this is one of those tea leaves that you use in making adjustments. I guess my question, Sarah, is on a Monday morning, diving into all the information flow of the next two weeks, where's your item of greatest doubt? And let me reset that question to where's your item of greatest doubt when Chicago Fed national activity shows two tepid statistics? Well, I think when we're looking at just the, the broader activity, so we did see some moderation continue in September. So I think the Delta variant was still hanging over the economy and people's activity and, and spending decision. But I think really what we see in, in the third quarter in September as, as we were seeing supply chain issues really come to the fore, as well as the, the Delta overhang, I think in many ways, this is uh, this is somewhat of an air pocket. And I think looking forward, we, we still expect activity to to pick up here in, in the coming months. But I think a big question hanging over the outlook remains inflation in terms of how high it gets and how corrosive it really gets to consumer spending. Okay, well, we're going back and forth on this this morning and actually a fair amount of shouting out on Twitter about it as well. Sarah House, educate us. When you study and guess inflation, what part of our price change do you study and guess? So when looking at inflation, you know, we are looking at the, the rate of price change. This isn't about the level, but it's how much prices are, are changing. So I think even as we talk about inflation, that, that rate of change, I think we are going to see it get worse before it gets better. So we're expecting the consumer price index to have a sixth handle on it later this year, and that'll probably persist through, through the first quarter. But then when we get later into 2022, so we're going to have some pretty tough base comparisons in the second quarter. And I think when we look at what's been driving these price gains, these bottlenecks, um, the fact that demand has been so strong, I think that demand element has been underappreciated in the, these so-called supply chain issues and these supply constraints that we do have an inflation receding later on, just as, again, this isn't so much about the level of prices, but it's about that rate of change. What's the appropriate rate that the inflation rate can recede to where the Fed officials would be comfortable staying put or not hiking as soon as the market is expecting them to? So I think if you see an inflation recede back towards their target, so roughly 2%, I think that does give them some confidence that they can continue to, to take their time in, in raising rates. So we don't think that they'll actually be raising rates until 2023. We think the, the market's priced in probably a, a bit too, too early for when that liftoff occurs. But I think the fact that you just see inflation receding back towards the target over the second half of next year, I think that's going to help the Fed be patient and continue to to wait for more workers to return to the labor market and that labor market picture to strengthen without getting too worried that inflation is becoming unbridled. Sarah, how do you square that idea that, frankly, the Fed endorses that inflation will come down significantly next year with the idea that company after company says that supply chain disruptions, labor market shortages will persist well into 2022, if not into 2023? Well, I think it, it goes to the fact that, again, inflation is going to get worse before it gets better. But we are going to see these, these supply chain issues ease over the course of the year. I think we are going to see workers come back into the labor market more, for, more for, forcefully next spring. That's going to take some of the heat off some of the current wage pressures that we're seeing. And so I think even as you have inflation remain elevated overall, it's that direction that the mm -hmm. Fed is focusing on um, rather than the, the outright near-term near -term magnitude. 12 month out, what's your year over year economic growth? Frame that for us at Wells Fargo. So for Q4 next year, we're, we're still around 3.5% GDP year over year. I think that the composition is going to look better than what it's going to when we get mm -hmm. the third quarter numbers um, this, this Thursday. So the fact that Thursday's numbers are going to be very much driven by inventories, not necessarily that inventories are being rebuilt. They're just not being drawn down as significantly. So I think that's really going to um, obfuscate the, some of the weakness that we did see in Q3, both in terms of real spending and the fact that we still can't source enough materials and, and products in, in this economy. But I think we get a few catch-up quarters later in, in 2022, which is going to keep that right. um, keep growth later later in the back half of the year above trend. You know, consumer balance sheet still remarkably strong. 
um, labor market right. income is is growing very very strong as well. So maybe for individuals, real earnings they're getting eroded right now by inflation, but you still have hundreds of thousands of people coming back in, into the labor market and seeing higher earnings, and that's going to keep consumer spending on on a strong track. Is it a service sector pickup Q2 Q3 next year? Is that what we're missing right now, and we're going to get it later on? Exactly. So we're going to see that pivot back towards service, services accelerate. So we've seen some demand for goods ease up over the, the past five months or so. So durable goods peaked five months ago, durable goods spending in terms of real terms peaked five months ago. But I think once we get to the end of cold and flu season, as you see people more confident about going out and spending, um, I think you will see that shift towards services accelerate. And of course, as you see that pivot, that's also going to help relieve some of these bottlenecks that, that we continue to talk about. We're speaking with Sarah House of Wells Fargo, senior economist. And Sarah, one of the biggest questions that people have right now is whether we're seeing a sea change in the employment marker with, market with a shift of power to labor. And this goes to the job openings that we've seen and the idea uh, that the skilled labor has been really missing for a lot of companies. How much do you see evidence of that shift in power to, to labor? I think we're seeing quite a bit of it. Anything from the job openings, whether it's the JOLT survey, the, the Indeed job openings as well. Um, I think we're certainly seeing it in, in the wage numbers. You know, last cycle we saw that businesses were absolutely loath to, to increase pay. It was the absolute last thing they wanted to do. And of course, here we have average hourly earnings up 4.6%. So we'll get a better look at what's happening with those wage and pay dynamics when we get the ECI out on Friday. So I think importantly there, it's gonna also show us what's happening across benefits. So of course, we've seen these headlines about the absolute pay, um, but what's happening in terms of perhaps those those one-time signing bonuses. Are companies having to hold the line a little bit more on the benefits to account for, for these for these nominal wage increases that, that they need to, to lure workers back to, to the job site? And so I think that'll be an important factor, um, as well as we think about the composition of this. So I think one thing we've seen is, is these wage pressures particularly concentrated um, in lower paying industries, whereas higher paid workers are flexing that power more in terms of non-pecuniary benefits. So um, where they work from, yeah. how many days they have to go into the office. And so that's a little bit of a different calculation in, in terms of how that filters through to inflation as, as just the pure wage dynamics to get some of those in-person lower pay service workers back to the job site. Sarah, if this shift really is going on, why is it that inflation won't be stickier than a lot of people think? Well, I think we have to remember what happens with productivity. So productivity is, is a way that we can afford to pay our workers more without actually having to pass on those costs you know, quarter after quarter. And so I think that's um, a factor that uh, I think it keeps the inflation outlook from, uh, from becoming uncontrolled. So we've seen, of course, major investments um, across all types of, of businesses over the past 18 months. And I think um, including in, in some labor saving technology as well. And so I think that's a factor that's um, that's going to, to help keep those wage costs under control. And again, I, I do think that we're gonna see some supply return. And so I think um, that's gonna have these, these wage pressures that we've been seeing more recently ease up over the back half of 2022. The constructive outlook there from Sarah House there of Wells Fargo. Sarah, thank you. Thank you very much. Coming up at the Open, in about 21 minutes from now, we'll catch up with Joanne Feeney, Advisors Capital Management Partner. Tom, we'll be talking about the week ahead, dominated by the week ahead's earnings from big tech. Well, not only the earnings, but the revenue. I really can't say this enough, John, that, and John Stolfus at Opco, I think, really laid this out nicely. Sure, there's the earning dynamic and all that, but his modeled revenue number is 16% up for the 117 companies that are reported. John, I did not expect that. Well, for the top five, what did I say earlier from Bloomberg Intelligence? 19, 19% Is that the number? for revenue. Thank you, I didn't know for that. For revenue, yeah. Thank At least you. the numbers are just fantastic yeah. in terms of what people are expecting. Which is really, <clears> frankly, the, the story of, of earnings. The idea here that people have seen the supply chain disruptions, they know that prices are going up, they know that it's gonna crimp margins, but it hasn't in so many uh, cases, and sales have just remained so robust. It hasn't crimped demand that much. I think that is a really big story, John. It's my favorite week of earnings, guys. Aww. Tech earnings. That's why I'm taking Thursday and Friday off. <laughs> to celebrate? Just to celebrate hmm. and look ahead to next week, which is what we really care about, right? Payrolls Friday, next week, and the Federal Reserve on Wednesday, yeah. Tom, the Bank of I'm England on the Thursday, entire week off. next week. You're off next week? I'm the whole week. You're yeah. off the Monday. Yeah. I've seen your diary. Tom Keane. I'm glad somebody <laughs> has. Uh, am I off Monday? You're off Monday. I didn't know that. You put it in. 
<laughs> no, I, no, you didn't? no, I didn't. One okay. of my All right. Well, I can did. confirm you've got a long weekend, Tom. I approved it last week. You've got Monday off. John, okay. I'm still, I'm recovering here. I watched Purdue lose to Wisconsin. How did that go? It didn't go well because they beat the Iowas really bad and they didn't. Did, they you, watch, did, not... did you watch Bama get it done? No, back, I did back not. Back on track. Good to see. And, and we got Michigan, Michigan State coming up, which that's we have a, to talk a, a lot about run, this Tom. week. That's a tough run. That's like the game of the century. We can spend the week talking about a team. Yeah. Why are we talking about Purdue? Purdue well, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Tommy Keys. I like got a day off on Monday. Their, their uniforms <laughs> look like the Colorado Buffaloes. That's why. Tom Keen, Lisa Bramitz, and Jonathan Farrow. Lovely. So Good show. Me. Up seven on the S&P. We won't New miss York. you, John. Goodbye. <laughs> and don't you what? <laughs> I won't miss you either. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> Man, it's like... With the first word news, I'm Laura Wright. A big move for the car rental company Hertz, which is barely four months out of bankruptcy. Hertz has placed an order for 100,000 Teslas. It's the first step of an ambitious plan to electrify its rental car fleet. It's the single largest purchase ever for electric vehicles and amounts to about $4.2 billion of revenue for Tesla. U.S. labor shortages will persist into 2022 and contribute to a permanent increase in business costs. That's according to the latest survey by the National Association for Business Economics. Some 36% of respondents currently experiencing worker shortages said they expect them to end at some point next year. None see it happening before the end of 2021. 14% see shortages abating in 2023 or later. Turkey's lira fell to a record today amid the country's ongoing diplomatic spat. Already under pressure following a larger-than-expected rate cut last week, the currency slid again after President Erdogan said the ambassadors of 10 nations, including the US, Germany and France, were no longer welcome. The countries are demanding the release of a prominent businessman and philanthropist. The military figure who heads Sudan's sovereign council says a new government will be formed hours after the prime minister and other officials were arrested in an apparent coup. The army leader declared emergency law across the country. Sudan has worked to end its international isolation since mass demonstrations overthrew the longtime dictator back in 2019. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 100 120 countries. I'm Laura Wright. This is Bloomberg. What we're waiting to see, we are waiting to see uh, the gas supply side normalizing. Mm -hmm. If the gas supply side normalizes um, and we see that the price is still at this level, then we know we have to do something about it. There we are with Tim Silva, the Nigerian Minister for State Petroleum Resources. This is global right now and it's also very much domestic, as seen in a gallon of gas. Wait for the heating oil numbers of this winter uh, as well. Prices are lifting again, uh, West Texas. Average up $85 a barrel. Brent crude just a dollar higher, $86 a barrel. On their way, it appears higher. Ellen Wald has been kind enough to join us uh, many times with the Atlantic Council, a senior fellow. Her book, Saudi Inc., is absolutely, absolutely definitive. Um, in Riyadh, Ellen, right now, what are the new elasticities? There are lessons learned along the way and then there's the changing or the percent change of the change that they can do, particularly in supply. How close are we to a supply adjustment? I think that right now, Riyadh is very confident that they are progressing along the right path. Um, definitely for them. Uh, I think that they see um, the fact that there is definitely tightness in terms of supply and demand as um, a positive thing right now. They were very shell-shocked by uh, what happened in 2018, which was uh, we saw Brent hit $85 a barrel, and then under pressure from the U.S. and others, OPEC Plus opened the taps, and the next thing they knew, it was December and prices were at $50 a barrel. So they're very much reacting to uh, what happened right. then and do not want to see a repeat. 
And that's really the question, Lisa. What do they react to if it isn't the single point price of $86.31 a barrel? And what are they looking at in terms of the swing producers? Because ultimately the shale patch had been the swing producer. And now that's being called into question a little bit more. Ellen, how much is that part of the issue that frankly gives Saudi Arabia confidence that they can wait a little longer and not cannibalize demand? Exactly. I think, and, and we have to understand that they are, are in close contact. I mean, they maybe not quite as close as the contact between Russia and Saudi Arabia, but they they know, uh, you know, what's going on in the, the shell patch. They know these CEOs. They understand what their considerations are. And so they have a good sense that, um, yes, we're going to see some growth in the shell patch, but it's not going to be anything like the kind of explosive growth that we saw in years prior. So I think they're they're fairly confident about that. Uh, one of the things I think they're also uh, looking at is um, they are very concerned about the fact that a lot of this climate rhetoric has been hurting investment in fossil fuels. And so having these higher prices right now kind of brings home their point that, yeah, fossil fuels are still a really important part of the energy ecosystem. And I do think they would like to see some of that pressure and that rhetoric abate a bit, especially when it comes to them, uh, despite the fact that they're going all out and making these net zero pledges at the Wait, same time. Ellen, this is really important, and I'd love for you just to basically put a bow on this, the idea that maybe they like the higher price because, frankly, it sends a message to uh, the uh, the energy uh, sort of efficiency debate, the, the green energy debate, the idea here that if you want it, you'll have to pay for it. In the meantime, you're going to see our oil prices continue to go up. Exactly. I don't think it's quite uh, an idea of, of retribution, but I do think that they have been battling with this, this climate messaging of saying, yeah, we care about this. Yeah, this is a big issue. But at the same time, the alternatives to fossil fuels aren't there. You still need us, so stop treating us like we're disposable. And so this is an opportunity for them to say, look, now you know we're not disposable and you need these fossil fuels, so let's, you know, tone down some of the, the very anti-fossil fuel rhetoric. And we saw that with these um, documents that were released that show that Saudi Arabia and some other oil producers have been lobbying the UN to try to tone down some of that anti-fossil fuel language in uh, a new uh, climate report. Ellen, uh, long ago and far away, Lisa Bram was paid for the offspring's education <laughs> by picking up uh, West Texas Intermediate Futures at a large negative statistic. I believe this was April of a year ago. Brent crude maybe never got there, but Brent crude was dirt cheap. How rich or richer or richest is Saudi Arabia in the last year and a half? They've made a lot of money. And um, as they continue to put slightly more barrels on the market each month, they're going to continue to make more money. And I think that they see in, in some respects, and they might not voice this out loud, but, you know, amongst themselves, I'm sure that they see that this is this is almost in a sense they're they're right because they have suffered through very low oil prices. They've done actually quite well throughout a period of very low oil prices, and they undoubtedly want to take advantage of these high prices as they can now with the understanding, right. I think, that, that they understand it can change very quickly. And especially with these developments in, in China in terms of another coronavirus right. outbreak. They're keeping a very close eye on that. Hey, Dr. Wald, I want you to pretend you're a market economist or oil expert now at a big Wall Street firm. What is the price statistic for Saudi Arabia of Brent crude and the collar around that where they're satisfied with that as a price? I think they're pretty satisfied with anything between uh, you know, they're, they're very happy with over 70. I think by the time we hit 90 or, or triple digits, they may be, be getting a bit nervous about some demand destruction. So we're definitely still in the range that they're quite comfortable with. Moving the collar. Yeah. This has been wonderful. Ellen, <laughs> thank you so much. Ellen, thank you. I appreciate it with Atlantic Council and senior fellow as well. I'm trying, I'm doing it in my head, Lisa. That's why I paused there. I was trying to do the math of what that means for a gallon of gas. Yeah, I thought you were just focused on the collar aspect, which collar?
goes best with a bow tie. Yeah, that's true. But, you know, you, you collar it. You, yeah. you don't have an individual statistic, well, but what is it? I don't know. I want to dovetail that, actually, into something else that I'm seeing in the market. The idea here of persistently higher oil prices is something structural. I'm wondering how much that really feeds into the 10-year break-even rate, which now is the highest since 2006. I think this is fascinating at a time when so many people are yeah. wondering what the yes. meaning of the T word actually is, if persistently transitory means anything to anyone. We're at 2. Six, basically 2.66%. That basically is that in 10 years, the expectation is, at least based on break-even mm -hmm. rates, and that the inflation rate will be uh, just south of 2.7%. And I'm so glad you brought this up because this is a conundrum. The break-even moves higher, folks, pre-financial crisis, and yet the 10-year real yield is just a negative 1.00. They're really not the same thing, are they? Completely different. And the question is why? How much <clears throat> is Fed intervention or how much is this, uh, frankly, something that is bigger and that is going to remain? And frankly, the answer will really drive, frankly, risk appetite. Because if those yields go materially higher, real yields, that will be a different uh, equation for Wall Street. This has been exciting. What an interesting Monday it is as Agreed. we dive into an earnings week that really starts with a vengeance. On Tuesday, there'll be much more for Green on the screen here, a nice lift to the market. Futures up seven. Ambassador Haas with the Council on Foreign Relations. Look for that. Good morning. This is Bloomberg.